welcome back to Ellis and Homies. Uh, I'm here with Bo Saywell of uh, G'd Up fame, founder of G'd Up. Co-founder. Co-founder, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, founder of G'd Up Supply. Yeah. And a boy who's made it all happen, the space I'm in. Um, just for a backstory, Peter will be watching this, one of my best mates. When we were 16, we used to go to a plaza, but we'd miss the plaza stop, like Penrith stop. We'd come down to Parramatta. And we used to walk around in your shop there, that uh, the small one. Swear to God, yeah, yeah. Bro, and I remember just walking through, and that's when I first followed you, G'd Up, and your brother on socials. When would that have been? 2016, 2017, when I was 20. 10, 11, 12. Yeah, yeah. So we, we opened that store in the end of 2013. We were there for about f- yeah, four or five years. I think we, I think we closed, I think we moved out of there um, in the last year of our lease, so 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a crazy spot bro it's like it's it's crazy to think how we um how we started the brand there you know only two years into you know kind of founding the brand when i was i was living up in brisbane at the time and um we actually didn't open that store first as g'd up um it was um i don't know if you ever went there beforehand but it was a like a streetwear store called crooklyn and yeah, yeah and my brother had another business partner who was also partners with us with um with g'd up and he he ran crooklyn out of there and so the whole idea was that um start Open the Crooklyn store, which is like streetwear brands from all over the world. So like yeah. Cooks and Castles and Ten Deep, all the, all the big brands that were kind of popping back then. And the idea was that we position G'd up next to those brands so that kind of validates it in the marketplace. And yeah. after we had that, or well, they had that for a, for a year, um, and then we um, we all opened the flagship store together. How old were you when this that was first opened? Um, twenty, I think. Wow, twenty. Yeah, two thousand thirteen. Fuck hell, twenty two. That's smart. Twenty two. Yeah. That yeah. is smart and young. That positioning standpoint is yeah. It was smart. particularly in a Westfield. Um, yeah. It's like um, it was one of those things, bro. When we started the brand, it we kind of went tried to go down the traditional route of trying to get into stores and yeah. um, you know building a brand. So we would like I remember e- emailing store after store, like bro, like shitty skate stores in in coastal towns and stuff because yeah, that's yeah. you know that's where you start. And um, I just feel like we were never taken seriously. We um, that was you know that the typical route that you would go down you try to get into stores and that's the way that you kind of get into the marketplace you build your brand and stuff yeah um and after getting shut down heaps of times um my brother was just like bro fuck it let's just do it ourselves and he was um he was always that kind of that that you know that go-getter of just like no let's do it our, our own way type thing and yeah. um and yeah it was mad and I, I just kind of followed he was a he's a couple of years older than me i was actually studying so i was dead broke and he was working as a graphic designer and stuff so he had um had a lot more money than I did so yeah wow he he bankrolled the whole thing um and you know I went I went to him initially with the idea we we didn't start as a as a streetwear brand it was a um we were like selling dead stock basketball jerseys and hats and stuff and is that where the uh cease and desist yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you probably heard that story yeah, before yeah. yeah um yeah from new era so it um then it just kind of yeah flowed on from there but yeah you're right it was crazy signing having a lease with westfield yeah. um and they man they're they're a crazy company to to kind of to lease a, a a spot from because they're just like they charge through the roof and they base they base what they charge on the foot traffic they get but yeah the foot traffic isn't always super relevant to each demographic so yeah. our demographic was you know like that younger kind of 15 to 25 year old male um, but the vast majority of the people who were coming through Parramatta were in a completely different demographic and, yeah. um, and it ended up getting to the point where we were like, we started to take like note of who we were converting sales to and stuff because they were bumping our rent up. That it's, it's pretty crazy actually. They, and we didn't realize this at the time that you don't have to give them your numbers, but they yeah. check in on you with ha- uh, how you're doing turnover wise. And they say it's just to kind of keep, you know, take measurables. And so they know how their stores are performing and stuff. But in reality, it's, what, what they do is that they see if you're performing well and they kind of say like, oh, you're, you're doing so well, you're growing because you're in our Westfields and they bump your rent up congruent with your growth. So oh, as you grow, they hell. bump your rent up so they can see how much money you're making and they yeah. just like, all right, cool. They, and some of the increases that we, that we felt year after year that we got from them year after year um, was crazy. So yeah. it, um, it was a good foundation to start the brand for sure. And it's, yeah, it was, it was nuts doing it so young. Yeah. Um, but I'm super glad we did. I'm not saying like if you could change anything because it's a stupid question. But if you look back on it, do you reckon Parramatta was the best spot to open it up? Because um, I've seen with Street X, theirs isn't in a Westfield. Theirs yeah. is like on the street. But when I think of that in 
Western Sydney, it's not really, there's not really a spot. It, it doesn't exist. It's like, bro, I think geographically, even when you compare Sydney to Melbourne, Melbourne to Perth, Perth to Adelaide, whatever, I think they're all so vastly different and the, yeah. the, the, the complexion of our city is, is so different to anywhere else. It's like yeah. if you tried to picture something similar to like what Street X, Street X have got, I can, you know, it's similar to some of the vibe you get down in Melbourne, but Sydney from an infrastructural but also like an energy standpoint doesn't really have that I feel like yeah. out in Penrith it wouldn't have worked because it might do now I think Penrith yeah. has got more a lot more of an identity and a kind of creative um, kind of fabric out there now but yeah. back then bro definitely not you know it was like yeah. that it, it may have worked for sure I think it probably would have siloed the brand I think the brand is still you know obviously it's it's roots are always going to be embedded being that we're from Penrith yeah. um, but I think I think Parramatta, to be honest, bro, it's the centre of Sydney, and yeah, I think I think it was the perfect spot. And being in a Westfield because it was like so fucking crazy, you know, yeah. like people you can you can get cheap, you know, um, leases and stuff, you know, on on side streets and shit. Yeah. And there's not as much risk involved, but like, bro, we we're paying like like three grand a week. Oh. For rent for twenty eight square feet, so it's like on top of unit production, wages. unit production, employees, and bro, yeah. we had no idea what we were doing. Like we were, yeah. we were kids, so I shouldn't say that. Like we we did know. Like we, we there was a lot more to know. There maybe. was a lot more yeah. to know. I think yeah. we were green, um, you know, and, and and we did it well. But in in the grand scheme of things, it's um, I think being in the Westfields kind of it's it's almost been um, yeah, kind of fundamental for even what G'd up is now. It's just kind of like that. Um, I don't know. It's, it it just feels like it's got a different energy, and I think putting putting it in the Westfields as opposed to um, you know on a side street or whatever is kind of like fuck yeah. you know from the get go it was it was validated as a brand yeah, from yeah. them because fuck we yeah. we weren't otherwise being kind of welcomed into the I don't want to call it the fashion industry but the streetwear we kind of we always felt a little bit like the um, kind of like the the black sheep type thing that yeah. really weren't really a part of it. But then we open a store in the Westfields, and all of a sudden it's like. You know that's that that's that's a big run on the board. Yeah, yeah. I've um I remember like when so growing up going to that store was sick because there wasn't like from a kid from the mountains mm. plaza had nothing like it, and then in the city you didn't even know where to start looking to find it. But if you did, it wasn't a streetwear brand so to speak. Mm. So I think that like cemented G'd up, and then when I think the next part after that shot was when the hoodies came. Mm. And what are those hoodies called? The the team logo hoodies. The team logo yeah. hoodies. Yeah. Now, when I was growing up, you guys were like the kings of streetwear. Yeah. And you were known within rap, like sport, you know, like the typical parts of the culture. But over the past two years, those have like hit mainstream popularity amongst, I'd say, 15 to 21 year olds, 22, mm-hmm. 23, mm-hmm. 24. What was that like creating those hoodies? Um, it's, it's interesting, bro, because it's like, it's, and, and just for full transparency, I no longer have like an active role in the brand. I focus solely on, on g up supply. Yep. Um, and that was as of, uh, you know, the back end of 2019, me and my brother just kind of having ran the business together for 10 years or whatever, um, just realized that I loved the kind of business to business, business, business relationship side of things, uh, more. Um, yep. so yeah, that, that's where I focus, um, a, a lot of my attention, but to answer the question, it, um, it was like kind of just realizing what it was that was working and my brother would always when he was designing um would always be thinking about how this is going to translate to the consumer yeah um and just try and whenever whenever we did louder pieces we would just find that they would sell more so yeah um I, i don't know exactly where the inspiration was from but Doing that big low, I remember when we first did it, I was actually in China on the ground um, when we first started sampling because we didn't do it on a hoodie first. We did it on a bomber jacket. Um, that was the first yeah, time yeah. that it was tried. Um, and it took us a while to um, to get that right. And I was actually there with our factories. I um, uh, w- When we had access to China, we used to go over, um, you know, try, try to get over there each year. Yeah. And this particular time when we first started sampling um, that style with the with the G on the uh, on the right arm and then the the the, the rest of the letters and yeah, the P on the P. left, um, it was hard to get right. It was a lot of tinkering with it, but I think when we yeah kind of saw that and put it out there, it's like fuck yeah. that's something that is just hasn't been <clears throat> part of me hasn't been done before. Yeah. Uh, and when it was released, it was like fuck it's 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 take on an, it's its whole new identity. Yeah. And I think because of how loud it is, it just yeah to to your point before it it 
stepped outside of just being in the kind of hip hop kind of yeah. you know if if you want to call it urban type culture type thing which is quite a um you know in australia anyway quite a niche kind of market yeah. but Fuck i yeah. think the resurgence of like australian hip-hop music and it kind of being influenced by uk rap music and drill and and stuff i think g Up was just perfectly poised it, it, whether, whether it was going to be that design or another design i think it probably has far less to do with 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 the design itself but more about g Up being in the right position at the right time for yeah. when that kind of ascent into australian hip-hop culture started going yeah. we we'd kind of planted the flag in in western sydney all those yeah. years ago and we were just perfectly positioned f- to be the ones to carry or be the be the brand that you know uh you know to to uh to be on the back of the hip-hop kind yeah. of culture as it grew and so i think it was all uh, bro it's it's weird in life like timing you know it's yeah. like it's when things like that happen, they happen for a reason. It's like we'd grind, we'd been grinding for years, and it yeah. just—I think we were there. And that, that jumper, that hoodie, that design, just ended up being the kind of spokesperson for that yeah. brand. And I think also it shoots well. It's loud. You can appropriate it with heaps of different colors. And now it's like our, yeah, you know, it, it's our marquee player. Yeah. The black, <laughs> the black as the hoodie, and then the red or the like the teal blue. Yeah, those are. the that's the shit yeah that, is, that it can go with anything yeah They're and the they best. man they just sell like crazy like i remember when we uh when because there was a period for around about six to eight months where we kind of when we moved out of our darlinghurst store and actually yeah. moved into a, a little warehouse just around the corner it was just me and my brother we everybody else from that we'd kind of built the brand with had, had fallen off unfortunately we'd had a couple of little falling outs with um we beat both each had like a best mate um, that was a part of the brand helped us build it for years and there was just some personal issues that kind of arose around that so they were no longer a part of the operation of the brand yeah. um, and you know obviously like all of our employees as well like we kind of when we shut down the two um, brick and mortar stores we were deciding to just focus just online so it was back to just me and my brother like it was from the very beginning yeah. um, and we actually um, my brother was yeah, going through some personal things at that time so we actually shut the brand down for like six to eight months and people were like fuck you know where's where's g up gone and that was when we decided to completely um yeah focus solely online yeah. um and yeah and changed a few things within the business and that was when i think that framework i think we'd spent so long building the brand making you know making all the mistakes that we needed to make and then retrospectively looking back at it and thinking all right fuck this is what we need to change and there was just a few different little pillars operationally um the type of content w- that we decided to then put out t- start, decided to tailor a lot more around my brother and his identity he's a you know he's a he's an intriguing figure oh, um, yeah. he's got yeah, you yeah, know yeah. and it's like it when people see it it's like it's it, it, it it's entertaining you know and it's something that you that you that you can look at and, and it's engaging you know yeah so we decided to build the content and the marketing around a little bit more around him um, and then focus solely online and use third party logistics and then yeah then he just could just focus on the designs bro and then it just phew, man yeah. it's crazy like we um, we were originally when we when we did the re- launch thing we we had some targets in mind we wanted to eat what we wanted to meet each month um, within 3 months we were doing that and then within 6 months we were like 10 times that wow and like that's, that's, that's crazy shit. yeah um yeah that's the shit. I um I was gonna say back to your point on the hip hop. I uh, I think I'd seen something about your maybe your brother had a connection to Hefs. Yep. I I remember to the day. So I remember Hefs at a phone box doing the not guilty freestyle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, goes absent for a few months, comes back, hits the scene like nothing else. Mm. It was and at the time that's when like I could kind of tell like oh like we're on an upward trage- trajectory, trajectory here, yeah. and um. Yeah, I remember Hef's been in the g Up stuff and him. I've heard him say he was a fan well before he started doing music. Mm. He's a kid from around Parramatta. Yeah. Um, and then off the back of that, like Hef's blew up and I just remember him in in g Up stuff thinking like, fuck, these boys have nailed it. Mm. Like, this is a, You couldn't ask for a better moment, better artist. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, the, the timing thing is, yeah, it's, it's crazy how things work out because um, Hef's older brother, Sam, um he 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 goes by hugo but he runs uh that brand hoodlin um those boys were coming into into the parasaur and would even make the trek into the into the darlinghurst store for for ages yeah um and yeah they you know that they'll we when you have the store i think this is also something that was really pivotal in in our in in g'd up being a mainstay and and positioning itself the way that it has is that when you 
nowadays you know the, the 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 path to creating a brand is that you start online and and yeah. And it, that, that's where a lot of brands solely exist. But being that we had our stores and the amount of events and stuff that we'd throw, you build these kind of intimate and interpersonal relationships with people. And we would just have people come in that like that we just know from there, like even employees and stuff that would end up coming on board as like people that were just fans of the brand. And so when you and because we've always been like a, a, a young kind of lads brand type thing, yeah. it's like you come in, it's not like going into another store, like going into a Nike or whatever, and you feel like the person that's serving you is, you know, a rep- trying to make commission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. like coming, it's like you're buying from, from us, bro. This is yeah. our shit, you know? And so you form those relationships. And then, yeah, when, yeah, like Hefs and, and so many other artists that have come out of, of Western Sydney yeah, that, that we've been aligned with, yeah. um, Stuff, it was like that it just made a lot of sense because the relationships were already there and it wasn't yeah. that kind of oh bro they're popping off Come, let's throw, and whack, throw some shit on yeah, it yeah no you know? it wasn't that at all it was before um, it was like as before he hit mainstream he was already like you could tell he was doing alright but he was in it as he was doing alright yeah so there'd obviously been faith put into him and then yeah. I think you probably got him one of the videos the Simba remix eh hey? yeah yeah and he um in the um in in the one of the Marzi Rook ones as well I think um, yeah, there was there was a bit there, and that was like, yeah, like there was a lot of activity happening around the brand, and yeah, yeah my brother kind of jumping in on that stuff. It's sick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah he's he's the he's the, the 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 photogenic kind of getting the photos type one. I'm all, I've always been a little bit more like, nah, I'll, I'll take the photos of you, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's he's the pretty one. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say with you and your brother, I the way I've thought of you from following since I was like 17 is your brother is very marketing like gets marketing mm-hmm. in terms of streetwear and then i've kind of noticed with you um you're really good with business to business and like your art more like artistic side like this space here mm-hmm. is beautiful yeah you may not realize it because you're here every day but yeah. like coming coming down here like this is the goal you know what i mean like this is the dream thank you bro would you say that's like the diff what's the main difference between you and your brother when it comes to like yeah he definitely bro he definitely gets the um yeah, yeah, the marketing and like the kind the of logo on the helicopter. Yeah, like bro, yeah, he's a, yeah, he, how he kind of goes about that thing. I think I've, bro, for me, I think I realized that um, what I, where I feel really feel at home is just building, just relationships, and I think that kind of lends itself to the business business to business side of things. And look, don't get me wrong, I'd still love to be, you know, ha- having a more active role within the brand. I think just, you know, there's. We, we, when you're working with family and stuff and over time it's like when you've got different visions and shit there's no point trying to force it for the sake of, yeah. of anything it's like if there's a way for us to still work within and around the brand and share the identity type thing and 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 both flourish then then that's what makes the most sense yeah. um in terms of our differences we're actually um we're, we're similar in the way that we think about branding and brand development and marketing and stuff um I think he's. I think he's a personality. He's a. He's got you know a lot more of the yeah that kind of the marketing the yeah. the ideas of you know, of how to build that side of things and I um and yeah I I tend to kind of look at more yeah the behind the scenes the yeah. re- building of relationships on yeah you know, on a business level whereas I think he he what he builds relationships with really well is from the brand to the consumer yeah um and that that is is told through the content through the pieces through the copy through the you know the walk and talk things that yeah. that that the boys do and stuff and i think that is yeah lend itself to um to him doing the business to consumer side of things and me doing the business to business side of things yeah yeah that's sick i um i remember his walk and talks they were a proper fucking laugh yeah they, yeah they, they bro that was a big catalyst for that cuz brands nowadays bro it's a it's what, what people need to realize is it's like it's, it's it's a place for people to belong and to engage and to feel like they're a part of something and then yeah. when you've got access to the people who are behind the brand it feels like you are a part of it and those yeah. walk and talks were, were genius and he actually just started doing it bro it's funny because he only started doing it because he lost his license yeah, and he would just fucking that. he would just he would walk everywhere bro he lost yeah. his license for like two years or something and and would proper walk everywhere so He's got that, bro. He's charismatic in. I, I think he, yeah, he's charismatic in that kind of 
jovial kind of you know he can that, that's how he is as a as as a person you know yeah. he's the kind of the um he's the larrikin in the room type the entertainer type thing yeah. so i'm a lot more serious you know and i think that lends itself and i don't mean serious in terms of i'm super serious i could still have a bit of fucking fun for yeah. sure but yeah. just where my mind's at type thing um in terms of in, in business it definitely lends itself a little bit more to the um problem solving and business to business side yeah. of things and um yeah that's it bro it, it, it it's worked out i think the way that it was always meant to yeah it's um watching g up supply come through as well those football kits those are the that's the shit so for people watching you've most probably figured out by now i'm a football fanatic mm-hmm. bo himself is a west ham bowl and then let's go yeah that, yeah. that g up supply those things i've seen come through are just the yeah. coolest thing in the world but i can't see them now being released under the g up co type of brand yeah yeah it's different you know, now yeah, yeah yeah it's more different but um i was going to say you mentioned it before darling her store yeah a few of my mates are watching and i'm one of his biggest fans joey badass was in there yeah and yeah Freddie gibbs as well Freddie gibbs yeah uh those were the two main un- noted mm. but were there any other ones that came through? yeah we had um static selector who's like one yeah. of the ogs um producers out of out of new york yeah. bro and he was um he well I, I actually think he's from maybe from boston but he was um uh, one of premieres kind of like you know um what are they called like students type thing it was yeah. like he's like, kind of like right hand man and 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 was close with him and stuff and we had him uh he was incredible bro he was we spent a couple of days with him ended up at the casino with him um a couple of other like a little bit more kind of underground uh u.s rappers like onyx and that you know i don't know if you know those that um, group is kind of like harder old school type yeah. rap um but anderson pack also rolled through one night that was a that's crazy, the shit that's the shit the story around that is crazy actually we um the one day boys i don't know if you, if you remember like one day yeah, um, yeah. like uh spit syndicate and horror show and and joyride and that had a collective called one day and they do these these shows all these they started as um as uh just sunday afternoon parties just around the corner here in uh in and more yeah. at uh the vic on the park hotel and it was kind of just like a hip-hop sundays event and then it kind of evolved over the years and turned into essentially yeah like they threw a couple of festivals and yeah they did one at the uni um, I forget what the venue is called, but one of the, the the uni in Sydney there. Yeah, I think it's Sydney Uni. Um, and Anderson Pack that was just when he was on the rise, and he headlined the event, and he was massive in the US, but hadn't quite transcended or translated to be massive in Australia. I think yeah, you know, we're you know we're a little bit disconnected with some with um we're, we're with some of the music that comes out of the US, but he was headlining and was just on the verge of of yeah of you know um, really growing um, and. I went back to my. I went back to the Darlinghurst store with um with a, with my mate Jez One from Fundamentals, and we were just there partying and stuff. Yeah. It's probably like ten thirty at night, and um, I look at like our, we had like the like our security cameras in the store, and we had like our office out the back of the shop, yeah. and we were just in there drinking. There's probably about five or six of us, and I look at the, up in the screen, and there's like like six or seven dudes just walk through the front door of the store, and I was like, fuck, who's this? Like, yeah, what's yeah. going on? We're not open because the door was shut, but it wasn't locked. I walk out there and. I won't lie, I was, I was pretty twisted. And um, I was like, bro, sorry, we're closed. He's like, no, no, I heard this is the, the place to come a party in Sydney after after a show. Yeah. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, th- like, this is our clothing store. Like, like, we are partying, but I'm sorry, bro, we're closing. He's like, I'm like, who told you to come here? He's like, he's like oh, I don't know, man. He was like, he was talking you know, in an American accent. And I didn't realize who it was at the time. Um, and he's like, this big, tall, like, English guy told me to come here. And then my mate Dave from the UK, who was actually, like, staying on my couch at the time, he yeah. was from the UK and something happened with the place that he was living in. He had nowhere to stay. Comes, like, bundling behind him. He's like, bro, bro, it's fucking, yeah, I invited the boys here. And I was like, yeah. oh, sweet, bro, what's your name? He goes, oh, Anderson. I'm like, oh, fuck, bro, Anderson Park, shit. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> so we just locked the doors and, like, and we just partied there for hours, bro. Yeah, and I was, yeah. um... There was that was a crazy crazy experience because it was like we were just, there was only a few of us kind of chilling there and yeah. we'd been partying all day so we were a little bit frizzled anyway yeah. um, so we had a mad night with him but um, yeah Freddie Gibbs Joe, Joe the Joey Badass story is mad um, we were in the studio with him for a few days like um, that is this this is after for context this is after 1999 yeah, yeah. and then yeah all american badass would have been a few uh, years later a few, yeah. few years later so it was when he was touring the um the yeah the first album yeah um and special special artist yeah he special. um and bro he's a he was 19 or 20 at the time and um i remember being blown away bro just how how wholesome he was he was yeah. just like this like 
I don't know, bro. It's like he, like we've had a lot of, you know, big hip hop artists and stuff come through and, you know, like they, they, they get treated like that every city they go to, you know, yeah, that's yeah. Like, you know, the spotlight's on them type thing. But he was just like an absolute gentleman and like was kind of like, kind of feeling like, it felt like he was like super grateful there to be in our space. And that for yeah. me is something that's, that's imperative in, in connecting with someone. But his level of insight and intelligence, not just in from a music sense, but just as a person, bro, like I was blown away. We, um, we how how it ended up coming about that we were that we linked with him is that we're with um with lee munro who's like one of like australia's oldest kind of hip-hop artists i think he was like yeah. australia's first artist signed to a major label what was his podcast Fig- called? oh podcast he had a podcast yeah yeah cool. yeah um fuck, i forgot what it was called but yeah he, he yeah he was doing it for doing it heavy for a yeah. bit he was um, one of the main reasons i started it really because he'd stopped and i was like i kind of want to plug a bit of a hole here yeah yeah like Hip hop and just creatives, business and like yourself yep. that other scene. Yeah, but yeah, yeah Lee Monroe. Lee Monroe, yeah. So he's bro. He's been you know one of you know, he's been in the hip hop game in Australia for for ages. Yeah. Um, and we were out to dinner at at some event or something, and he just he gets a call actually. So we had um, uh, no, sorry, that's a lie. This is the story. <laughs> it was Lee Monroe. It was Lee Monroe who linked up the the studio that we went to, but we we're with J Fifty Seven, who who had produced a bunch of shit with Joey, and he uh, was a friend of a, of a friend of mine. Um, he was dating this friend of mine, Jordana, who whose like father owned like the best sandwich shop near our store in in, yeah. in Surrey Hills in Darlinghurst, and she was a friend of mine, and she was dating this producer, J Fifty Seven. He's a, a part of like a a group called Brown Bag All Stars, and he was also linked with Premier and Static Selector, and that's how yeah. we got access to all was those guys. Him? No, he's from the US. He's from he's from New York. Yeah, right. They had met online, and like he was oh, coming wow. over to see her, and yeah, I don't I don't I don't know too much about that kind of situation, yeah, yeah. but she was dating him, and he was you know he was older than we were. She said, um, you know, I, I want to link you with you. I want to link you with, with my boyfriend, Ra Ra yeah. And so we just caught up with him and um, we were out to dinner down in Darling Harbour and we were just kind of catching up and, you know, we didn't know too much about him. He was an absolute gentleman. We ended up becoming really good friends. Um, he just gets a call and it's Joey Badass. And he's like, bro, I've just landed in, I've just landed in Sydney. I know that you're here as well because they'd obviously chatted. They yeah. worked together on, on I think, I'm pretty sure he produced some of his album. I'm not sure. Um, and he's like, uh, Joey's like, I, I I need a studio spot. Can you link it? And he just gets off the phone. He's like, he's like, bro, do you boys have a studio? I'm like, no, nah, I don't have a studio. But the only person that I know that I, that I think would have access to one, like now, this is at like nine thirty, ten o'clock at night, yeah. um, uh, is Lee. And I knew that he had, uh, he and his mate Rax had a um, a studio just there in Chippendale called Signation or something. And yeah. and so I just said, I called Lee. And I was like, bro, can you can you open the studio? With Joey Badass wants to come through, and he's like, yeah, sweet. So. We all just kind of like just just drove. They got the address and end up spending oh, like. Shit. And there was there was I forget what the track was that he recorded there with us that night, bro. And it was I didn't th- I don't think he released it on an al- on an album, but um I remember hearing that track when it came out and think like fuck we were there when we produced yeah, it with him yeah. and we just got a bunch of drinks and we were there until like four or five in the morning and bro he's just like an absolute sweetheart of a man, an absolute genius. Yeah. Um and was and we didn't even say anything about the brand or anything. How it came about that he ended up asking about the brand was that. Uh, my best mate had one of our, our pinky rings on. I remember those. Yeah. And he was like, bro, fuck with that ring. Where's it from? And he's like, oh, it's actually our brand. He's like, well, you boys have got a brand because we didn't want to... Like, back then, bro, yeah. like, we were, like, we were proper fam. Like, bro, this is, like, one of the biggest artists yeah. in the world right now. One of the best rappers that's doing it right now. Yeah. Um, so, we, we're super trying to keep it cool, you know? Yeah. Um, so, we didn't tell him about the brand or anything. You don't want to come across as, you know, trying to trying to Seven. front like that yeah. you know yeah um so then it, and then it, we were like yeah we do and they end up showing him and that was then he came through the store the next day we went to went to his show we're backstage with him and yeah. ended up becoming mates and like yeah we got his number and texted a few times and yeah bro that was that That's one that link with him was mad yeah he's um that i remember saying that at the time because i remember being in, i was in year seven when 1999 came out wow and then because uh, i think like when i think of artists that like would have made a difference like steez is like i know you know yeah i think like genuinely like the per the one person that if they were here steez was that and um and then yeah i remember seeing all that stuff and it was just the coolest thing to me because i interviewed 24 karat kev yeah and i think he hung out with him later on during that time yeah he took him to bondi and did an interview with him and whatnot yeah yeah and then all american badass came out when i was in year 12 
Yeah, wow, so that's five years. 2017. Yeah. And yeah, did you hear his latest address, uh, Survivor's Guild? No. So he had his latest album. Uh, forgive me, I forget what it's called. Holy shit, I can't believe I forgot what it's called. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, there's Survivor's Guild on it. And that's his uh, whole address to like Steve. Wow. I, like, I was like pretty emotional. Man, like we, we didn't talk to him at, at length about it. Um, he, he mentioned him a few times and stuff, but he was... Um, he would just say, he, what, what, what stuck out to me the most when he, when he talked about it, it was just like the, the kind of like higher spiritual level that, yeah. that Steve was on type thing. And um, it's heartbreaking, bro, because it's like, yeah, fuck, you imagine the impact. But I think that's also a bit of the curse with those who 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 will, who who will would have or who do have the most impact, bro. A lot of the time it comes with um, sometimes a little bit of extra baggage and that's yeah. hard to carry, you know, because yeah. it's like those who know... I feel like there's some people in this world who just who know something who know something else. You know, there's yeah. their, their yeah, minds yeah. and their energy and their spirits are, are on a different wavelength. That's just a little bit beyond, you know. And they're the they're the leaders, you know. There's yeah, that's people like Da Vinci and shit. And yeah. bro, a lot of the time, sadly, it's it, it become a, it, the the weight can, the burden can become a little bit too much, and it's it's, yeah. it's a sad part of of the truth. Yeah, yeah. Rest in peace, Steve. Yeah. Long live Joey. He's I, I've said if he was in the 90s, he'd be in people's top threes. For sure. Like, I agree, 100%. Yeah, him and Nas. Yeah. Obviously, Nas was then. Yeah. But those two would yeah. go back and forth on that. Third well, spot. I think a lot of like the real hip-hop heads um, already put him really high up. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. he'd be in my top five globally. Yeah, yeah. I, um, Kill Illuminati. Mm. It's just like something that I'll never get over. That yeah. is one of the best. Like at 17, to write that yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah. Like, in year 12, I was fucking around at parties <laughs> in Woodford. You know what I mean? Like, these kids writing that shit. I, um, Freddie Gibbs also. Yeah. He's quite a character. Yeah. Like nowadays, at least I see in his interviews and podcasts. Yeah. What was he like? Did you see the video? We did like a, there's a, there's a link on, like yeah. A, on YouTube? Yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, 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 it was so funny, bro. It's like, we were thinking like, that's going to get mad. It's going to get heaps of views and stuff. I think it's probably to this day, it's probably got like 1,200 or something. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, that was mad, bro. He was interesting because... Like, I feel like we engaged with him more afterwards, kind of via text and that. When he was in the store, bro, he um, he was super disengaged. I think he was just like, just, he was just stoned out of his brain. We put a bunch <laughs> of food on and, and some drinks and stuff. And he was cool, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but he was just like on his phone the whole time, just showing us videos, bro. I think he was just super stoned. And yeah. he had a bunch of his mates there and they were kind of, they were getting into the vibe and drinking and shit, bro. They took like 60% of our stock off our shelves. We were like, boys, help yourself with some stuff. And they're like, fuck, I know. And they just, yeah. they just grabbed everything. I was like, fuck, I didn't really mean that. But yeah, yeah sweet, bro. Like, I'm, I'm not exactly going to tell you, you can't have that now, am I? Like, and they were just like, about six or seven of them, they were just grabbing shit. And I was like, all right, mad. Like, like, ho- ho- hopefully it gets, you know, it gets noticed when he's yeah. wearing it or something. I don't, th- I-, I don't think we ever saw Freddie Gibbs wearing anything. Joey Badass wore, wore the pinky ring on, on Jimmy Fallon, um, which was sick. sick. When it zoomed in on the microphone, you could see it, which was pretty cool. Um, bro, Freddie Gibbs is mad. Like, he's, a, he's an absolute legend. I think he's, bro, he's, he's just also a super gangster. And he's, yeah. I think he feel like he doesn't really give a fuck, you know. He was, yeah. he was, he was like, um, polite enough, but he wasn't really engaging. He kind of just... I think he had just smoked heaps of weed and was just kind of like mad and just just ate and drank and watched videos on yeah, his phone. Yeah. But we appreciated him coming down. And, you know, I think, for, again, like I was saying before, it's like these artists who are traveling all over the world, bro, they, they go and do these types of things yeah. all the time. So it was mad to have him there. It was cool. But to be honest, bro, we, di- we didn't get a lot from him. Yeah, was yeah. A, there was a period there when you can see on the video, we, we chatted a little bit and, and stuff. But then for the most part, bro, it was mad just kind of just sitting around listening to music and yeah. drinking some piss. Yeah. <laughs> Have you, like you mentioned just before, Joey Badass on Jimmy Fallon. Mm. In terms of the brand getting in front of eyes, um, in terms of product placement that's not on put on purpose, mm. would that be the biggest plug? In terms of Joey Badass, that yeah, one? Yeah, on Fallon. Yeah. Um, or has there been someone wearing a jade up? Bro, um, Flavor Flav got arrested at, at LAX airport. Um, from from Public Enemy, bro, wearing a jade up hat, and we don't even know how we got it. We never met him. We never like he's wearing this red jade up hat. I don't know if you remember with the like the core logo on the side, with like a little wreath thing on the side. Eh? Yeah, I posted oh, on my personal those. thing, bro, yeah. and he's like getting arrested for having a bunch of weed, and that was like pretty crazy. But bro, that came across our um came across our desk, and we didn't even know how he got it, bro, because we we never met him. We we're yeah. not sure, but um. Yeah, probably. I think like I think back then. I think nowadays it's like it's 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 kind of neither here nor there. I think because the brand has grown so much, it's kind of like it's 
th- that's not really even a thing anymore yeah. type thing you know it's kind of like we've got brand affiliations and, and people who buy it but it's uh, sorry uh, brand affiliations with with music artists and stuff but it isn't like a um something that's kind of super set out the relationships and like the collabs and stuff that that the yeah. brand does now it's it's ones that are close to home and that makes sense you know yeah. how would um I was, to move on with the brand what's your favorite pieces you've done because my favorite i've actually got it in the bag over there i bring it i have oh, that sick. um cream bucket hat that had the bulldog Oh yeah, yeah, to, yeah. My sick. head's too big now, but when I first got it, it was perfect. Too. That's funny. Yeah. As your head kept growing, bro. Yeah. <laughs> bro. I don't know what happened, but it used to fit perfectly. Now it sits a bit too high. But so, what, your brain's growing, bro. Yeah, yeah hopefully. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, what was your favorite product? Because you, you guys used to have this shit, man. Like that hat just reminded me those reefs. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. I've man, fuck, the, we've done so many pieces. Hey, for me personally. Um, there was a period there where like all I would wear was like navy t-shirts and we had I don't know if you remember the ones with like had like the crossed baseball bats and even just that we had one um like a navy t-shirt with like a kind of off-white cream kind of just like the um team logo across there the t-shirts um were were probably yeah the ones that I that I fuck with the most but probably my favorite would be bro and it's so funny we did these I think maybe 2018 ish um they were like this vintage style jacket kind of um a boxy type shape had like this like um navy panel on on this side like a dark green panel on that side and then like the big um like circle logo on the back and it was like this cream kind of vintage type jacket kind of baseball yeah baseball kind of yeah like vintage kind of boxy like cotton material um and it it bro it didn't sell that well but it's probably like i still wear it today i took it to europe with me um and it's like yeah probably like five six years old yeah. Um, but bro, to be honest, all of it, the brand has kind of grown and changed so much over the years that it's like, fuck, there's that many pieces like, bro, it's crazy. Like it's, it's probably like e- each month is probably like 40 to 60,000 units going out. That's you know, nuts. it's like, it's, it's crazy That's to think. And so the new, even like the new styles now and like the new, the, the, the kind of vintagey kind of zip up track set that we just did, yeah. um, with like the high collar and stuff did it in the, in the gray and, um, and kind of like brown and then the um, black with the blue, that's that's sick. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, but there's too many to too many to know, bro. Yeah, I um I've still got it. It's a bit too small for me now. I gained a bit of weight over the years after school. The navy blue, so G'd up in the middle with the a bu- blue box, and then play for keeps on the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Play yeah, for keeps yeah. Is yeah. The shit. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Um, I actually messaged your brother back in the day. There's a song by Dave, and uh, do you know D Block Europe? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they had a song come out called Play For Keeps. Yeah, yeah. And I sent it to your brother and I was like, fuck, put this in a music, like a video for you. Is that yeah, it? yeah, yeah. That was the shit. shit. Bro, it's funny where that came from. It's like, you know, when you when you were younger, I don't know if you ever had like Pokemon cards and that, but when you play, it's Yu-Gi-Oh. like Yu-Gi-Oh, Yu-Gi-Oh or whatever. Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, something, you know, yeah. and it's like you, you play or whatever and if you win, you play for keeps. So it's like, I'm yeah. going to play you, but you need to know like what's at stake here. It's where yeah. we're keeping this shit and you're not getting your cards back. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know what I used to fucking play? I used to go to match attacks tournaments. What attacks? Match attacks. They used to be the prem trading cards. Oh right, heck to you see two dollars a packet. That's how I know your West Ham boys. Yeah, yeah, it right. Wasn't FIFA it was proper. You get the and you get a big binder. Heck to go down to Windsor where the old Lotto factory was, and you play eleven v eleven. You could what? have like one from each club. Yeah, and you'd play and you'd keep this like eleven. That's mad. And people had. And money. how would you win? Uh, like how, how was so the game you played? Had a defensive stat and an attacking stat. Yeah. So you'd pick, like, say your centre mid. Be yeah. like, I want to attack with my centre mid. So, they'd, centre mid's defence would have to match it. Right. Got yeah. Sick. And whoever yeah. came out on top, you then yeah. take the card. Yeah. That's wild, bro. Yeah. You Mad. Start, man. I used <laughs> to... I, I stockpiled because I, I knew my football. So, I knew like who had from the shit clubs was like the shit. Did you play when you were younger? Oh, yeah. I still yeah. play. I'm playing... Yeah. I'm coming back next year. Man. I am... Um, Fat Pilo is actually... Dead set, bro. You're not fat, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, dead set. That's just the... That, I could, I could Pilo, that bro. Hit a dead ball. That's my thing. Can you? Yeah, that's nah. dead ball's my thing. It wasn't Good even majestic, Pirlo, bro. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, I played. Um, yeah, my whole life right up until I was four. I um, went from like yeah playing like just like club level, um, and then when I was like eight or nine, um, went and did like because you can only start playing reps when you're eleven. Yeah. Um, and I played went from the age of nine, um, trained with like Nepean and Panthers and stuff back when they had clubs in the yeah. um in the Super and Premier Leagues and stuff, and then went to um 
uh, Mount Druitt Town and Schofield Scorpions and a few others, but kind of got to about that eight, that 15, 16 age group and just kind of um, fell out of, not out of love with it, but the political side of it and the pressure and shit. And um, it's yeah. super, super heavy in Australia. I think it's that, that yeah. old tall poppy kind of syndrome shit. I've got a good book for you if you... You'd, my dad uh, played for Marconi, same with my zeal, um, and played for Schofield, all that good stuff. But um, my dad ended up later down the track becoming friends with Les Murray. Wow. Through business. I've got a book I've, at home. I've got the Les Murray book. Is that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the World Game. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, World yeah. Game. I've got it. It's sick. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the shit. And then yeah. there's another one by Joe Gorman, who was actually from Katoomba, same age as the Fundamentals boys. Yeah. And it's the life and death of Australian football. And he talks about how good the MPL and NSL were. Yeah. But the downfalls of the politics that came with uh, clubs representing ethnic communities. Yeah. And and that's sad, man. Yeah. And what the A-League taps into now is family friendly, but that's not what football was. So it's like... And it's also like, yeah, like not what football... Sorry, I shouldn't say football is not family friendly, but all over the world, it's it's fanatical, you know? And that's where the energy and the excitement comes from. That's where... That's also where the money comes from and stuff. So it's... Yeah, it's it's that weird catch-22 and it's... And it's sad because it's, you know, you even just see what happened, was it with Sydney United recently and stuff yeah. uh, in the final of... I was there. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. bro, like that, it's hard because like that type of excitement and stuff is great, but then it's also, it's super, super damaging. And it's yeah. like, it's when, when we talk, start talking about hate speech and all of that, it's like, that comes into it. It's like organizations like the A-Leagues, as they call it now, um, they, they've got a tough task. Cause it's like, what do you put first? Yeah. I was, um, funnily enough, about that. So there was two incidents: the Nazi salute, which mm-hmm. is unforgivable. That's yeah, that's one. But unfortunately, that was like what was that wonder is if one guy did the wrong thing, mm. it's like fuck, that, like you're wearing the club's kit, yeah, like, fuck. But um, at the game, oh, so I was with two mates. I have a mate. I have people in each team that I knew. Yeah, and I knew boys in the uh, active sport of Sydney, Croatia. None of us at the stadium, even the blokes who were standing next to her, knew that she was doing a welcome to country. Yeah. Combank, you could not hear it, and yeah. she wasn't on the screen. Right. But as soon as Murdoch Media got a hold of that, crazy. On TV, obviously, she comes out and you can hear her. Yeah. At the game, we had no fucking clue. She wasn't even on the Combank screen. Really? And then. And that's the thing is, you don't really watch what's going unless it's on the screen. Yeah. You don't really watch what's on the ground because there's, there's so much happening before yeah. the game starts and stuff. And yeah, I, right. That's I've, interesting. I've spoken to boys from like Sydney, Croatia, in and around them, and they knew straight away. Like, if 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 something goes wrong, uh, we're fucked. Like, this is they're waiting for it. Fuck. Because do you remember Rebecca Wilson? No, she passed away. She was like head of Daily Telegraph, maybe or the Herald, right? And she released like reports of the miners who lit flares at the Wanderers games and yeah. put all their faces on the back page. And that was the that was the, so the, the beginning of the downfall. Yeah, that, after the victory brawl, but like. I always thought to myself, I was 14, 15. My brother is four or five years older than me. Yeah. So he used to go with the RBB, but he's like he's skinny white boy. He's not, not the, he's not on the front line. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah. But he used, to, he used to love it. And um, yeah, that was the downfall. And then what the true downfall was, was the club didn't back them. Mm. And then active mm. sport died around the country. Isn't it crazy, bro? Like you see, it's like, Bro, what even happened? Because I remember, like, I was living up in Brisbane, right? And when the Wanderers would come up and play there, bro, like, there'd be even be marches going, yeah. like, and it was sick. And it's it's sad to see. It's like, um, it it, it, it it's funny because uh, a good mate of mine, who um, Ben Miles, who, who's the head of a, a creative agency, a worldwide creative agency, but he heads up the South Pacific one, a, an agency called RGA, and they were the ones that kind of headed up the um. Uh, the A League's rebrand and all that, and kind oh, of sick. Uh, decided to get nerve. And um, who was the uh, was it Sampa the Great or who was? Do you, do you remember that with the A League song when it first when they came out this year? Nerve and it was a female Australian. No, no, I think it artist. was Sampa. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sampa. Also, yeah I, my apologies if if it wasn't, but um, yeah. So they were kind of a part of that kind of trying to wrap their heads around trying to trying to you know bring back the culture and stuff into into the sport and and bring that energy back around it and it's. And it's such a monumental task because there's so, you know, yeah, because of all the politics, the restrictions and all that. It's like, yeah. 
that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to engage the hip-hop community, trying to do those things. But if it doesn't... Yeah, and I think they did that part well, um, but it's just like it's... Yeah. It's gonna it's it's, it's gonna be a slow process, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know those guys those guys are geniuses with the way that they go about you know their their marketing and their kind of brand development and and uh, and all of that. So um, the A leagues are in uh, in terms of a marketing and kind of cultural sense are in good hands. But I think it's it's still a massive massive hill to climb. Oh, it's massive. Hill. We can't we can't get there for a long time. Yeah. The only way is to go back to traditional clubs, but yeah. um, it won't happen. Not yeah. as long as Lowy and the boys are in charge. Yeah. But um, I was going to say, have you seen the new? And it might be like your friend involved with it. Uh, they have released back like behind the scenes footage. So they basically, do you know like thirty for thirty docos? Yeah, sick. So they got cameras in the changing rooms, but they're releasing it weekly. Mad. And uh, do you know Charlie Austin? Yeah, 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 He's playing at Brisbane. Yeah. And he walked in the change room. Connor Chapman conceded a penalty and scored no goal in a game. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he's right back or left centre back for Brisbane. Charlie Austin comes in and blows up. Yeah, yeah, like proper English football, yeah, like, yeah. and um, they released it like a week later, like a blow up. And the, they didn't come to like fist; they were just yeah. yelling at each other. Yeah, um, and obviously they make up. It's football. Like ten minutes later, you're sweet. Yeah, but they released that, and I thought when I saw that from like a consumer, like and football fanatic, I was like, that's all. Like that's a move. Like, yeah, we're moving yeah. somewhere here. Yeah, that's how we'll get people back. Yeah, you're showing a bit of passion that the players yeah. show. Yeah. But, we got a long way to go. Well, I think, bro, it's like similar to what we we're talking about before. That kind of behind the scenes thing with like what what we did with G'd up, doing that that more kind of that raw type of footage, bro. Because yeah. I think, bro, the consumer nowadays knows when they're being sold to. They know when they're being lied to. There's you know they're, they're picking that shit apart. So that kind of raw, unfiltered access is is when they feel like they're they're being invited. You know, they're not say, they're not nothing's being forced down their throat. Something's being put there and it's like it feels like an invitation to be a part of this you know yeah. and i think that's when you know it's it, that comes down to innate human nature when when you're invited and welcome to something bro it's like you're, you're you're gonna you're gonna be yourself in that in that space so similar with marketing i think it, something like that i think it's a good move because it's like they've got to figure out something bro because it just fell off the face of the earth yeah yeah it's got a it's got a long way to go i don't know where it goes from here mm. i think i think the nrl are doing all right but their nrl we touched on it before the play rights yeah shocking i've yeah. said it on like four or five podcasts now. Mm. I can't believe it's still mm. like the NRL can just look at the NFL and go and the NBA and just be like, why can't we do that? Well, bro, like, you know, like, like we were saying before, like we just launched the uh, kind of collaborative brand with the Rabbitohs, um, District 1908. And so they came to us and we had a meeting sitting right here and their whole idea was, um, you know, they want to create a subsidiary brand that is aligned with the Rabbitohs and, you know, from uh, from from South Sydney's fabric and culture and stuff, but without you know the Rabbitohs branding, so yeah. that's a it's it's an alternative way for for the supporter to represent the club, um, you know, without because with all like a lot of the merchandising and stuff, um, there's rules in there like with that uh, that the sponsors logos need to have certain certain amount of um, space on it and stuff yeah. like. There's a lot of rules and and kind of loopholes and stuff around the NRL's licensing agreements and stuff. So. Um, they're, they're having a conversation. I think the Rabbitohs are going to be at, at the forefront of, of trying to change that kind of like old, like I feel like the NRL is still stuck in um, that kind of like 80s rock and roll, older kind of like yeah. white mentality type thing. It's like okay. there's so much culture and energy to be infused into this, but it's like they're too scared to fuck with it because they've, I don't know, I'd, maybe it's the decision makers or something, but something's got to change somewhere because why? It's like, unfortunately, bro, it's like, it's not cool to like, you, you, there's there's more people like he's wearing a Brooklyn Nets jersey right now. Yeah. Right? There's more people in Australia wearing a jersey from another country because it's cool because that's how they market it because it's, yeah. you know, they they it, they align themselves with, with what's, you know, uh, you know what, what what's popping culturally what's you know like where that there's good energy around it but i feel like the nrl is just kind of st is stuck in this box and it feels like it's just from like the 80s and 90s and it just can't get out of it they yeah. need to break those shackles with a design perspective you just mentioned his jersey you just got me on a train of thought nrl design for jerseys would you change mm. anything well, this is the thing, bro. See, like when I'm designing for clubs, like when I've like designed things like soccer jerseys and stuff, or football jerseys, we'll call it soccer for the sake of this conversation because a lot of people in Australia call it soccer. But um, and then like footy jerseys, like NRL jerseys, bro, they all look the same. It's all like the the angles, the 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 yeah. the, the, the hoops, the all of that. I personally, so we're we're actually developing um, a, an app at the moment with G'd Up Supply that essentially. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail because we're just we're just finishing the um uh the prototype and stuff at the moment. Yeah. But it's essentially it's it's about automating what we do as a, as an organisation. It connects pretty much sports clubs to um to to designers to manufacturers and kind of like that's yeah, shit. Yeah, I, w- I won't go into yeah. too much about it. But we've been working with a lot of freelance designers all over the world and how beautiful football kits are, soccer kits are, particularly over in Europe, right? And look, don't get me wrong. I think you know the NRL kits are, are cool, but yeah, like why? Why is there also that box? There's, it seems yeah. like a, with a lot of the marketing, the identity around the NRL, it's kind of like within the confines of of this particular kind of I don't know outlook and look and kind of everything. And yeah, the jerseys, the even down to the artists they they, they get to play at the the halftime shows or the opening yeah, shows. Yeah. A lot of that, you know. Yeah. Um, I would change it, bro, for sure. It seems like they're just they're all super repetitive year in year out. A little bit gets changed here and there, but they all look like just like small variations of one another. Even the fit and the uh, the heavyweight yeah. material, it just like you think of a football kit, it's light and yeah. it's not bulky. It's slick. Yeah, Whereas the NRL kits, they're just like. Well, I think a lot of that comes down to durability. True. So that, that, that would be the reason yeah. for that. Well, sorry, I know that is the reason for that. So when we do like a training shirt or whatever yeah. for like, like we do like the West Magpies and the West Tigers and um, a, a bit here and there. So the training kits we do, we use a, a, lower, a lower GSM. So GSM is um, like grams per meter. So it's yeah, got to yeah. be the weight of a fabric. Um, and the playing, I, I imagine that's, that there would be, there is some um, like prerequisites and stuff that yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of weight. And you'll notice that like in, on all the seams, they're like they're super overlocked and stuff yeah. so it's but and that's just because of the the, the amount of contact yeah right so yeah. a football a football jersey there's you know, yeah. you, you tug on it and you're fucking you know it's a yellow card you know yeah. so every single there's how, however many sets are in a in a, in a rugby league game yeah. if you or those jerseys would tear the yeah if, if you put like the epl jerseys in terms of the material they would bro they'd rip instantly yeah so that's what that is but I think you could, that doesn't that the functionality side of things doesn't need to change, but just how they look. I, look, I don't know. I think maybe it's it does look kind of like stronger and bolder. You see a lot of the um, a lot of the European football clubs now. They're they're they're, they're almost like they some of the kids are like fashion forward and you know a little bit kind of you know like feminine in in the, some yeah. of the patterns and stuff. Maybe that doesn't translate to to rugby league. Maybe it does. I don't know. Like I I would like to see a change because you look at like some of the kids. Um, with yeah, like you know, the European clubs. Yeah, it'd be mad to see rugby league clubs do some stuff like that. What European clubs do well is when they get a sponsor in, they will change the sponsor to fit the. So like Celtic sponsor yeah. is not yeah. a gold sponsor. Yeah, yeah, but it's gold because there's gold compliments on the yeah. kit. Yeah, and and like that, it just the sponsor. It works. It yeah. like almost like disappears to the naked eye. Yeah, you don't really notice them. Yeah, they're obviously there in the middle of the shirt. I think the NRL try and get that happening well, I some think, of the sponsors are just like fucking right well you look the at middle. the types of like um, brands who do all of the European kits it's Nike Adidas they're also and then you compare them to the brands that are doing the kits here in Australia it's yeah. you know it's yeah yeah, I, I couldn't even name a lot. Like it's your ISC or Classic and that. They don't have... <laughs> they don't have... Uh, they're, they're not brands in their own right. They're just yeah. kind of suppliers. So I think because Nike and Adidas and New Balance or Puma and all that, they're brands first and foremost and then, then they supply the kits. Whereas... The brands in Australia, the, the suppliers in Australia are just suppliers. They're not brands. They don't have that brand identity. So at the forefront of their kind of, you know, their, their design outlook and stuff is they're, they're probably not down. They don't have fashion designers. They've probably got some guys who, you yeah. know, design, who, who design the kits and stuff. But those like Nike, Adidas, Puma, all of those um, are absolute powerhouses in the athleisure and sport yeah. kind of space. Whereas the suppliers here aren't that. Yeah. Do you reckon a capital would go Australia over here? I think, like, look, it's, like, yeah, I feel like any brand can work, bro. It's, like, it's got to do with um, with, with, with shooting their shot and kind of making it happen. You know, there's yeah. that there's that brand, Castore or Castor, I'm not, I'm not sure what it's called. Um, I don't, I personally don't like their logo, um, but, they, but the kits that they produce, yeah. they feel like that kind of hybrid, you know? It feels like they're leaning, they, they could be one of the first to kind of switch it up a little bit. Yeah, fuck yeah. We'll get off the NRL chat. You... Uh, from talking to you, following socials, listening to the podcast you've done, reading just your Instagram posts even, your mind is very, um, it seems to be like a very 
the way you view business and life mm. is very interesting to me. And when you speak about business, you mention things that are a bit more, uh, they take a bit more of a th- depth of thought process. Mm-hmm. How does that all come about? Like how, is it through reading? Is it through just doing business itself and getting in there? Nah, I think, man, like the way I kind of view the world is that everything is like a direct derivative of, of oneself. It's like my relationship with you, my relationship with my business, my fiance, my mom, everything is all derived from how I perceive myself. And so business is, is, is fed by my understanding of myself. And I, I think I learned that at a young age. Um, you know, kind of leaving, coming from Penrith and going up to Brisbane. I won't get into the into the whole story of kind of how that happened. I've spoken about it on on a few podcasts, but um, I essentially, you know, growing up in Penrith, it's you know, it's a, a smaller kind of town. Um, you know, I think I you know relied a little bit on kind of like you know knowing everyone, having you know, and, and a bit of a reputation yeah. or whatever type thing, which is typical in those types of areas. You know, sixteen, seventeen year old kid, and you know what it's like out in Penrith type thing. And yeah, when I moved up to Brisbane. I, I was kind of like, look, I, you know, I, when I was you know, a teenager, I'd, I'd get into fights and shit at parties and my brother was, a, you know, kind of had a bit like, not a bit of, but like a big kind of reputation around the area. Yeah. I'd find myself kind of leveraging that and using that to kind of validate myself because I thought it was fucking mad that my brother was just, you know, yeah, tougher, yeah, older, yeah, older lad, you know, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was a teenager, but um, I, I also had a couple of experiences and a few things people said to me where it was like, you know, um, that you know you're kind of just in your brother's shadow type thing and not that was an issue but i think i kind of felt as though um yeah i realized at a young age when i moved up to brisbane is that i was like i've got an opportunity here to kind of figure out who i am instead of just being a product of my environment from where i'm from type thing and but in the first few months of moving up to brisbane i was still doing the same type of shit you know i was like fuck it so then i realized like all of my behavior every word that i speak every relationship that i build is is has to come from me i can't be implicated by what goes on around me and yeah. so when I learned that, that then flowed into onto everything in life. And I think like or everything that goes on around us is is essentially non existent unless we allow it to be. And so it's like our perception of everything is is in one way or another derived from our perception of ourselves. And then yeah, I apply that to my business and that that's kind of been my Oh, I thought there was someone out there. Were you yeah. looking? Oh He's, bro, that's you. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> it's a reflection yeah. oh, <laughs> sorry we all good um so i think that kind of and i think when i learned to be super introspective and self-aware at such a young age um you know i think that's a lot of people go on that path but kind of only start to figure it out you know maybe in their mid-20s or something that i was starting to think about that and, and then started to read about that and and look into you know psychology and stuff what age is this um 18 19 fuck i only did what you're saying exactly i wasn't i've never been like a fighter or whatever mm. i only started figuring out myself t- at 21 i'm 22 now well that's bro even that's super young and i think i think that's the kind of path that everyone's on and but hat and this is like i think it was so pivotal for me that i moved to brisbane yeah um because it was like it meant that i that was there was only i had to take onus and responsibility for absolutely everything you know yeah. and i think in on on a societal level and a, and a social level when you grow up around you know your friends and your peers peers and your family that affords you a certain level of security and i think yeah. that also then can sometimes breed complacency and so you can kind of plateau in your personal development of how you regard yourself how you regard the world and stuff and i think moving to brisbane kind of took all of that took that security blanket away from me and i was like fuck i've got to own this you know and yeah. i um you know, there's, there's, you know, some on, on my dad's side of the family and stuff. We, we don't know him. He left when we were like 12, but, um, there's some, uh, yeah, like mental illness and stuff like that. And so when I was like a teenager, growing, I was super scared of mental illness, right? I was like, yeah. fuck, I was super worried that I was going to get like schizophrenia or something like that's really, yeah. and would get in my own head about that type of thing. And then, um, moving up to Brisbane, I was like, that kind of really just helped me, I don't know, kind of like zone in and just kind of be at, at one with myself and then become super introspective and then understand that everything that I think, feel, do and say is like, I, there's no one to blame other than myself. And yeah. so then when I started to own that and then develop that and then that then, you know, then taught me to in turn be empathetic to everybody else first and foremost, because when you, when you do that and you understand your relationships with people, then kind of, you know, gives you opportunity to grow and, yeah. and vice versa type thing. Then that just, then when, when I kind of learnt started to look at myself introspectively like that and then i went on my business journey i think the two kind of just went hand in hand and then one and then i realized that that perception of myself is what feeds my business acumen my 
my how I engage, how I connect, how I create opportunities, it first and foremost is from from yeah that relationship with myself and then investing that into human beings like if you think about everything that happens in the world in one way or another is 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 formed from and and within a relationship of some kind yeah. every business opportunity every you know our, our romantic relationships our relationships with our family it's all just it's all just energy being transferred you know and so i think yeah. i kind of yeah realized that i don't think i realized it in a business sense, it's something that I think you realize almost like retrospectively and then you continue yeah, to apply it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, bro, I think business is just another vehicle to kind of, it's, it's, it's like art, just like another expression of, of yourself type thing. And I think yeah. taking that mindset into everything means that I, I, yeah, I first and foremost try to make, you know, deep and honest connections with all of our clients, with even with our consumers when we're building the brand. It's like authenticity and, and, and providing value and empathizing with ev- and understanding other people's situations and then ensuring that, that I tailor my approach uh, in how I service a client or how I engage a client and how I speak to a client or try to understand a client is yeah. first comes from, you know, from listening and um, it takes listening to yourself to be able to listen to people properly. Yeah, wow. Beautifully said. Thank you, Beautifully bro. Beautifully yeah. said. That's, that's some user experience. Yeah. Yeah, some interesting. So that's where, yeah, that's where that kind of comes from, bro. It's like it's yeah. all, for me, it's all intertwined, but it all, it's, it sounds super like whimsical and spiritual and stuff and in some ways it is, but it's like, Bro, we, we, we own everything in in our minds and business is just another uh, another thing that is kind of governed by our own minds and how we yeah. look at things. So it's like, for me, they all just link in, in yeah, many you ways. S- you said before, and I've noticed it with how my year's gone. So essentially how like I've ended up in this room. Do you know CG Fez, rapper? No, I don't. Matt would have worked with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I messaged him like a year and a half ago. I was working at JB Hi-Fi at the time. Yeah. And I came in, do you want to do a photo shoot? I have the brand, but it's not really what I want to do. I kind of want to move it into a media and then mm-hmm. just use this as um, a vehicle for, for cash that. flow. Yeah, cool. Um, but essentially messaged him, did a few shoots with him, Young Six, and then it kind of died off. And then I met Nick Air Films and Bomber Sneakers. Man. So then I'm like, fuck, I want to do a podcast. Get Bomber on. Bomber's the first one. And as I did the podcast and I stopped That's why he does the, like the custom, custom scenes, shoes yeah, and, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, it's crazy to crazy, watch. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, and Bomber and Nick are like mentors essentially. I talked to them a fair bit and um, become quite close with them. And then as that like came along, as I started the podcast, I stopped going out, playing my European trip. And I started to like realize who I was, what I stand for, mm-hmm. who I actually am. Because I'd go out every weekend and just talk shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just mix and match. And, um, and then as it's gone along, like you find opportunities just create themselves almost organically. 100. As you keep building. And that's how like, Crazy, there's got one of my best mates, Peter's watching right now, like clapping because we used to walk into your store. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, it's just... Bro, gradually. it's crazy. For, yeah. for me, it's... it's it, One thing in particular when we moved into this space, um, I started thinking about like energy wavelengths and I think there's like the way that I also, in, in regards to yeah, those connections and I think, bro, first and foremost, if you're, an, if you're a music artist, if you're in business, if whatever you're in, like I said before, if, you're, if, if you've got some unresolved shit within yourself... Um, and which I think we all do, but if, but if in a way that it kind of dictates how you engage yourself and other people, then you need to work on that first. But I think, I don't think, I think life is, is a pursuit of, of trying to understand ourselves. I think that's, I think that's literally what it is about. I don't think you can ever be a complete, have that completeness in, in understanding yourself. I think it's, it's a pursuit of that, but I think when you do understand at least you know a certain portion or, or if you're at least learning to be honest with yourself then i think your energy wavelengths kind of figure out what your what your language is and then for me it's like every like since we started jet up supply bro we've pretty much never had a website we don't run any social media it's all just yeah. business that has come to us based off um word you know of, of, of our relationships and stuff right yeah. and yeah and word of mouth um and it's like i've started realizing that as I'm getting older, it's like the more people that I connect with, it's like we share that wavelength. And on that wavelength yeah. is a particular language. It's I don't mean language as in like a like linguistically, I just yeah. mean in terms of how we how we connect that, that there's a let's call it a, a love language, you know? Yeah. It's like and you find people that share that wavelength with you and yeah, to your point before, bro, it's like when you when you I think when you first start to be honest with yourself, bro, the world just starts sending people that are on your wavelength. It's kind yeah. of like a like a radio frequency, right? You know, that yeah. this station plays that type of music, that one plays that type, and it's like I feel like we as human beings have got a particular wavelength and I think when you have the balls to first be honest enough with yourself, 
it's, I don't know, bro, the world and its energy and shit and all the little particles of the fuck it is start sending yeah. people and opportunities and things your way and lessons that providing you're always being honest with yourself, shit will just keep aligning, bro. It's like, it's like a bit of a magnet type thing. And I think providing you are, it, you, you continue down that line of, of being transparent and honest with who you are, bro. That then trend, translates and transcends into everything else. And then people see that and it kind of becomes a reflection of the, of the relationship. And it just, yeah keeps connecting and shit will keep happening bro providing you keep following don't and you don't let yourself be masked by needing to make money or whatever make decisions for sure and make money i I actually wrote a post yesterday i I don't don't know if you saw it um about uh, about my favorite movie snatch i just got some artworks off i've Um, seen that when i yeah um and and uh, i i'll I'll, I'll read it i'll you know what i'll read it out yeah go for (laughs) it um who was in snatch again uh, Brad Pitt, uh, yeah, Jason yeah. Statham, Vinnie Jones yeah. from Manchester United, bro. When he when he he was one of one of that was one Wimbledon's of his first best ever kids. player besides Zach and Fenwa. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Vinnie Jones. Um, all right, I'll just read it out actually because it was like it was yesterday afternoon. I was like, I felt like, bro. Sometimes I go up and down. And I feel like I'm a little bit kind of like I feel more spiritually awakened or on or on board or creative or motivated. And I think coming yeah. back from Europe and I did Thailand and stuff this year. Um, the first week or two back from Europe, I was, you know, struggling with a bit of, um, uh, what's it called jet lag and stuff. But yeah. this past week I've, I've felt on, you know, on these, these artworks, I've, I've been sitting on these artworks from and this incredible, um, artist from over in Perth for a couple of years. He did them digitally and I'd planned to get them printed and, and hung up here yeah. ages ago and just never did. And I was like, fuck, I'm going to do it. And so I did it last week. And when they arrived, I was like, I, um, I just sat down to just write about how stoked I am that, um, that I got them and it ended up being like this kind of like, yeah, super kind of deep kind of introspective post that I did not intend for it to be, but it just yeah. happened. I just walked in here and just started punching away and more often than not, that's what, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of like the beauty of journaling, right? It's yeah. until you get it out of your mind and put it down. It's not until then that you have the capacity to really realize what it is yeah. and digest what it is that's, you know, embedded in your subconscious. So anyway, I'll, I'll just read it out because I thought it was, um, I, I thought it was cool. I uh, said, a couple of years ago, I commissioned Kaya Kill, one of my favorite artists, to create a nod to my favorite film, Snatch, to be hung over, uh, to be hung over on the wall, uh, to be hung on the wall over the desk in our office. Snatch is a movie about risk, reward, and all the fucked up shit that can happen in between. It tells a few parallel narratives that intersect, coincide, and ultimately implode with one another, all in pursuit of a common desire. In this case, an enormous diamond that changes hands among many of the characters throughout the story. It also ends up either, while... It also ends up either while inadvertently killing or hurting those who come who come in contact with it along the way. I watched this movie uh, before bed almost every night for six months straight while doing my HSC. I probably didn't know it then, but in reflection, I can see how the movie is an allegory for life and how it has, in some subconscious way, influenced my own life along the uh, uh, my own life along the uh, along the way uh, along with my thoughts. It seems like we're all chasing something in this world. We've got an agenda. We've all got an agenda of sorts. We often get lost and sometimes hurt in the pursuit of the unattainable gem, whatever that may be, whether it be success, attention, money, power, validation, growth, or whatever. There is this baseline desire to always want more, which, you know, I think is the societal structure we've created as a whole and is kind of inherent in all of us to some degree. This isn't necessarily bad, but if your intentions are impure or if your greed plays any role, then in almost all cases, wanting more will end up bad for you in one way or another. So instead of following... Instead of allowing your life to be dictated, uh, d- dictated by that desire for more, focus on what you know, focus on what you feel and what you love. At the end of the movie, it is the two main characters who essentially knew nothing about the diamond, but who, but who had been beaten, robbed, cheated and seemingly had a loss the whole movie who ended up on top. The one main thing that separated those two was that was that they were never governed by greed. They never stepped on, on one person to get above the next. They stuck together, stuck to what they knew and were ultimately rewarded for doing so. Um... Yeah, good. Hang on, sorry. There's a. Um, I said. Uh, I, I guess what I've learned is is that while it's great to want more, it's the insatiable hunger that need that lead. While it's great to want more, it's the insatiable hunger that leads to growth and success that we all seem to be after. But if it takes losing sight of yourself and what you stand for to get there, you will likely end up paying uh, paying much higher price. Mu- paying you'll end up paying much higher than that of the original asking price. So stick to your guns, my friends. Be honest with yourself above all else. The wins might not be as big for now, but be patient. Love those who help you and help those who love you. I promise you wins will come. It will be way easier to sleep at night and that when and that when the ending of the to the story that is your life is ready to be written, it will be one that is that is fulfilling and within your favour. Beautifully said. Where so it's kind of like fuck did you learn to write like that? 
PAC. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like one of like what I've what I've kind of realised. I didn't when I sat down. I just wanted to like do a bit of a shout out to the artists that, yeah. that made the artworks. And then I started thinking about the movie. And I'm like, fuck, you know what? It's like the two guys in the movie. Like everyone in I don't know if you've seen Snatch, but everyone in the movie is kind of is chasing this big diamond. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so Guy Ritchie. Um, is, is the director and they're all chasing to get this diamond and it changes hands and they all like end up getting like shot by a gangster or fed to pigs or that's so it's, it's this crazy kind of English yeah. gangster movie but the two guys who are just these boxing promoters Jason Statham and his little matey they kind of they're never chasing the diamond and all they, they stick to they stick to their guns they stick to what they know they stick by one another they're loyal to each other they don't change really who they are the whole time they, they usually end up at the brunt of a lot of the fucked up shit that happens but at yeah. the end of it they're the ones that end up with a diamond it's like yeah. bro that's that's really what it's about it's, be honest with yourself, bro. Don't change that shit for, for the sake of, of wanting to, wanting more in terms of money or this and that. So that's why shit's starting to happen for you. You're getting a roll on with what you're doing yeah. with this because it's like, all right, mad. Yeah, you're looking at this and you're like, you're being honest with what you want. And I think at a lot of the time, people when they start a clothing brand aren't honest with what they want. They think that yeah. it's fucking cool, which it can be cool, but it's also hard and it sucks to fucking build. Yeah. It takes a long time. And the ones that cut through the fat and end up becoming a brand with an identity and energy are the ones that that were honest with themselves it's yeah. like it's super hard to do that so it's it's good to see you on your path bro yeah. and, and navigating through that I, i'm still figuring it out every day because i drive for work courier yeah i sit in my van pump podcast whatever i'm pumping tunes old j cole whatever it may be i'm just sitting there and you think of so many different directions and i'm still yet to figure out in terms of clothing and design what my direction is mm -hmm. that's why i mentioned that other brand too because yeah. that's my shit like yeah. that's my that's what i know mm -hmm. truly but like, I, I just know uh, the podcast and the people I'm meeting and I was a student of the game until like I still am, I always will be. Mm -hmm. But I was a student since the age of 16 to 21, I monitored everyone in Sydney, Man. who they know, what they're doing, who offers this, who's like Lee Monroe is a good yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. You go and ask someone, they won't know who Lee Monroe is. You ask anyone with an idea about music in this yeah, country. Yeah. That's like yeah. Godfather material. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah, one yeah. of the dons. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I just kind of built up. And um, yeah, still figuring my way out every day, but I'm just fucking enjoying it. Bro, and to be honest, that's really what it's about because it's like I think we, we, we've convoluted our intentions so much in this world with social media and all these falsehoods about what fucking matters, bro. But the only thing that matters is the connections with the, that you, the connection you got with yourself and then how that translates to the, with the, uh, the connection that you have with the people you love. Yeah. That's fully it. Yeah. Everything else that comes, bro, it's like, yeah, man, do well and, and, and have your dreams and shit, bro. But it's like, if that shit isn't down pat, none of that is even possible, let alone, yeah. it, let alone having it matter or anything. You know, yeah. it's like, so don't forget about that. If it's like, you are going to have obstacle after obstacle if you you don't have that those connections down pat so yeah. bro be honest with that part and you watch your world open up yeah yeah that's true I've, I've, I've um yeah the more i focus on like building relationships and it all started in a studio in glen denning um my mate flat he's a producer bring me along to just film out the back and fez was there a guy called marvs who's it comes full circle tomorrow night he actually has an album listening party Man, i'm going to his at the spot at, at, in glen at denning? studio love yeah. that bro um and I actually have nothing to offer in terms of music. I'm not a producer. I mm. don't own a label. I don't own a studio. But uh, when the boys play me something, I give them feedback straight away. i be like, hey, uh, just from listening to a fuck mm. ton of rap, UK, mm. US, Australian, like yeah. even Ghanaian. I could, yeah, I could tell man. you. And uh, I just give them straight away like, hey, here's what I think. Uh, and what about this flow? What about this amount on the like what about eight bars on that man and then that's like the i've I noticed like maybe two months ago that's why i get invited back to these things and that's value bro, they don't right? get um they don't get the feedback and that's yeah. where my value is yeah if someone is just happy to be like i fuck with it but 100 yeah and and that bro that then that again comes down to honesty and it's like you're being honest about that you're not scared to give your opinion or your idea or and like you know, this is the thing about opinions. It's like, it's not necessarily opinion in a bad way. It's like, like you're bringing value because yeah, you've listened to so much, right? Yeah. And so it's like, bro, that is like, in terms of when you said, I don't have anything to offer in it. And I said, bro, you've got plenty to offer. And it's like, yeah. it's continue to do that shit, bro. Speak your truth, connect, like share your ideas. Because if, if, if nothing else, like, what, what what do we really have if we're not sharing what we're fucking thinking bro and that's yeah. that's where everything comes from a thought that everything that is conceived in this world every single thing bro that has that has been developed or communicated about started with a seed of a thought yeah so share as much as you can bro that is there yeah. where that is where your opportunities will come and don't hesitate to continue to to share like that because that will be 
the foundations and the fundamentals for everything that comes, you know? Yeah. And that, that's what I realized in, in business and in life. It's like share and connect, bro. The more words that you speak, the more you're going to be understood, the more you're going to be able to understand more people, the more opportunity, the more connections that you'll make, the, the more that you'll learn, the more fulfilled you'll be. Yeah. Continue doing this shit, bro. It's super important. Yeah. Do you, would you say it's a key thing, feeling fulfilled in what you're doing? Um, in, yeah, in your, yeah, yeah, for endeavors. sure. Yeah, I think like... I, I'm in a bit of a like a, I, I'm in a, in a bit of like a, a transient kind of transitional phase at the moment because like while I love making clothes for sure I'm also way more passionate about the connecting I want to I want I've got books to write I've got I want to keep doing my art I want to well, all I want to do is, is engage and connect right but yeah. it's super hard to monetize that so I think yeah I think fundamentally it's it's important to be fulfilled um but it's also not necessarily always super realistic. I think there's, I think there's some middle grounds to be had, and I think yeah. you can, I think you can put, you can map out and put plans in place. Like I'm with Jade Up Supply, I've, I've got like a ten year plan that I just want to make as much money as possible to then give, you know, to, to have the real financial freedom that that I need to be able to just really get to that that deeper fulfillment, that personal fulfillment yeah. in a business sense. Um, you know, I think building the brand for a long time, I, I think I, I, I ticked off a lot of that passion shit and you know, I built it with my brother for 10 years and, and I was fulfilled in a lot of senses for that. So now I'm able to, with not that I'm not passionate about jet up supply and making clothes because I am, um, what I'm really passionate about is, is understanding, connecting with the people that I'm, that I'm doing the work yeah. with. Right. Um, so I'd love to be able to, yeah, find a way to spend more time and be super fulfilled with that. But I, in order to do that, I know that I've got to focus on the business side of things and keep make you know, keep developing, developing um, our service offering and all of that. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's, I think, I think it's super important to be fulfilled, but I think it's also, you, you, you've got to be realistic about it. So it's like, don't just like, uh, bro, it's, it, it's such a subjective thing being fulfilled that yeah. it's like, you, it, it's one thing for me to talk on it, but then what is being fulfilled? And uh, to me, I think it's strip it further back, bro. Be fulfilled within yourself first. Just be yeah. at peace with who you are as a human being. If you've got fulfillment there, then what you do when you're working shit, you, you're already miles ahead. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's that old thing, you know, when people talk about being fulfilled or having a passion and stuff, bro. I think there's so much information and so much shit going on in the world now is that it's so hard to find out what you're passionate about, yeah. bro. It is. And to, for, to, to have a business or a job or a role or whatever. So I think it's a, it's very different to what it was 20 years ago, bro. When, when the opportunities and stuff were, were, were a lot smaller, the, the amount of things that there are to do and engage within the world and the amount of information that we're fed yeah. through social media and shit can really convolute what it is to be fulfilled, bro. What the fuck does that even mean now? Yeah. You know, cause it's like, it's, it's so hard. I think we're, we're, we're consuming so much information that it's like, it's, it's a big, big rat race on a, on a massive scale now. So yeah. being fulfilled in your job, Definitely, but make sure you're fulfilled in yourself first. And more often than not, your, your work and, and, and your business or whatever it is will, will probably fulfill you to, to yeah. the amount that you need. Yeah, I, um, I've, that's something I've struggled with too. Mm. Like feeling fulfilled within myself. Because mm. I feel like I'm, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near where I could be. Because I know what I'm, I can do. Mm -hmm. But I, like, you're also your own worst enemy, you know what yeah. I mean? And like, yeah, I don't know. I've, I resonate with that a lot because I think that... I'm just trying to put it into action as and, and it's And it's hard to action, bro. It's yeah. not something that I think it's like, I've got this kind of concept um, called called immediate retrospect. And it's about learning to to learn the differentiation between your thoughts and your emotions so that you can, you know, when you think when something happens in your life and it upsets you or whatever, and it can almost make you feel a particular way for a couple of months and you look back at it while you're no longer implicated by the emotions of, or the immediacy of the emotions of yeah. that situation, you look back and you're like, fuck, you know what? That actually didn't affect me that much. And retrospective forge you that foresight and you're like, okay, hey, cool. That's my lesson from that. Yeah. So I think it's like in terms of actioning that kind of knowing yourself or being fulfilled in yourself, it, it seems like a bullshit. And a lot of people listen to this and be like, what the fuck do you even mean by that bro because it's like it's it but by definition it's hard to define what yeah. is understanding yourself type thing and it's and it's 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 something that i think yeah is hard to kind of wrap up and that's a part of my journeys when i say that it is hard for me to explain what i mean but i use this as an example um and and that it's it's that concept of immediate retrospect and so it's about affording yourself to recognize affording yourself the opportunity to to feel retrospect to, to have the retrospective learnings of something instead of it being in three or six months way further down the line, to do it then and there when, when you're in the immediacy of a situation. And I think to do that, you need to learn to understand the difference between your thought and your emotion. Your emotions are what your environment around you kind of um, 
kind of perverse upon you and you feel yeah. it, it comes in your emotions that but then there's somewhere along the line where there needs to become a disconnect where you, your rational thought then understands what those emotions are and yeah. that then decides how you react and i think when when you can learn to control those two things and be like hey i'm not i'm not going to let this implicate me it's kind of like i don't know if you know ryan holiday he's a, um, a he writes a lot about stoicism and stuff yeah. and um a lot of like the early philosophers kind of live by that it's like this only this only affects me or, or governs me if I allow it to. So yeah. I think when you can learn to do that, that's when you know yourself because it's like that that impulse to react to something based on how it made you feel. That's then going to govern what happens to you next and how you feed next. Yeah. That every moment leads into into the next, right? And our, our emotions and our thoughts are are a part of that kind of that kind of snowball effect. So yeah. I think when you can learn to master that a little bit is when that. Is, is, is how you can define that knowing yourself is, is learn how to control to react to things and, yeah. uh, and, and not become a product of your environment we've also got like a mindset was like I feel like you, your environment should always be a product of you you're, you should never be a product of your environment yeah. right? and so when you can learn to flip that it's like alright mad that's when you kind of then you've got the freedom when you know yourself yeah. and you'll get that because it's like I, I feel you bro it's like yeah. I, I'm still like I'm, I will never uh, uh, profess to completely know myself and be that I'm still figuring heaps out as well you know yeah. I think I think it's about learning those little parts along the way you can apply it to business and be fulfilled in that sense to be fulfilled within yourself yeah. it's all one big you know flowing kind of cycle yeah. bro and I don't think we'll ever completely be there yeah what was the actual term you mentioned before retrospective a, uh, immediate retrospect immediate retrospect I I reckon I can do that pretty well across life. Like I've mm-hmm. I, this year and last year, I um I had an incident earlier in the year, and I kind of realised like I'm like I wasn't who I thought I was, mm. and I've kind of I can handle situations now a mm-hmm. lot better than I could previously. I uh, don't worry about what others think or like are doing. I couldn't give a fuck anymore. But um, Fiorentina, I can't do it. I'll say it again Fiorentina yeah I could never do it I can't yep. sit there when something happens at my football club yeah go, right, I, I, right. Can't, I can't control my emotions. I think that's a bro, I think that's something that sits out outside those realms you know when yeah. you're with a when it when it, in terms of like that and, and I think that's the beauty of sport pro like it's like that when, when shit happens it, yeah it's that raw kind of ungoverned yeah it's it sits outside the that shit and i think that's the beauty of it bro it's yeah. another thing that you can't really define it's like what even yeah. what even is that bro why yeah. do we care so much i don't fucking know bro you just do all it's right a- we're back on battery died Not gonna, <laughs> i don't lie on this podcast so yeah say, say what happens it. battery died sd car ran out uh what you were saying before how you think like six months down the track as soon as you said that mm. you know vlavich vlavich you know you've a striker fiorentina boy oh yeah 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 it's been just over six months since he left us and i yeah. still like like if i see his name or someone like people mention me in conversation i actually like sit there and like say the c word to myself like, <laughs> call him a beheaded snake or anything, but that's I funny can't. bro you know what i think if you've got family ties see like bro, i'm a west ham supporter but i don't I'm, I'm not super emotional i'm emotional when i'm when i'm watching the games yeah. and uh you know when i'm following and stuff um but I think if you're if you're a Fiorentina supporter because of your family, bro, I think I think there's something that's that's, that's deeper with that, you know. Yeah. And I, I don't have that with 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 any sport really, you know. I only I only started supporting West Ham ten years ago at the age of like 21. So, yeah. um, and when it comes to NRL, like I'm from Penrith, so, so I support the Panthers, and then I do a lot of work with the Rabbitohs, and and John Sutton's one of my best mates. So, yeah. Um, that's why I support them. So it's I don't know. I think that 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 deeper fanatical thing, and I think obviously like. In Australia, we don't really have it, but I think for you, bro, yeah. with f- seemingly, bro, with, yeah. <laughs> with your antenna, the, the the purple dragons, bro, yeah. like if you, yeah, if you're like, if if you if you can't do the immediate retrospect thing when it comes to them, bro, then um, you know, yeah, that 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 that's a proper fan. I was going to um on the last one, classic football shirts had a a replica, not an authentic. I couldn't afford an authentic, but uh, a replica of uh not Batistuta, but Deco. Oh, hey, and it dude. was all, it was a decent price. I was actually going to bring it in. That's mad, uh, yeah, bro. They um, their, their story, classic football shirts, like how they built over the years, bro. Yeah. What? They like, that's with, crazy. Um, Sheffield Wednesday, yeah, leftover kids, yeah, yeah, and then just went around to all just the snowballed, third, bro. Division. Yeah, fuck, they've got um. Have you seen like the the, the warehouse that they've got? Oh no, nah, they have got like the one off. So like Ian Wright game worn jerseys now, <sighs> and like just that caliber of like legends, yeah, and then they've got. Like those shops and warehouses and everything. It's crazy. Crazy. We don't have it over here. Someone um, someone could feel that if they could get a sure. contact with them. I just think, bro, like the issue, not the issue, but the obstacle with Australia, with anything cultural, whether it be sport, music, fashion, whatever. Like 
first and foremost, geographically, we're so far away. Yeah. I don't know how you know how much of a part that plays with 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 trends or even just the energy. I think you know, like a, as a nation, we're such a, a big big country, but yeah. with, with a very small population, kind of per capita type thing. Yeah. So it's like I don't. It's like it's like things just don't. It's almost like there's not enough people. There's too much land and not enough people for there to to be. A, I think it's just going to take time to, to get like the depth and the energy that that Europe and America and stuff yeah. does because of the amount of people and the um, you know the Western history in those you know yeah. obviously in, in Australia we've got you know our, our indigenous culture my background's Aboriginal and like that's the oldest in uh, the oldest civilization on Earth but yeah. it, in a in a Western kind of sense you know we're only what fuck how old is it? a couple hundred years old or something yeah. so it's like the Brands like and, and clothing brands and music and everything. It's like I feel like it's like just doesn't just doesn't quite catch up to the pace that's nah. all over the world, you know. So yeah. you could yeah, like that. There's, there's definitely an opportunity for. There's always gaps and stuff in the market, yeah. but even like with us with G'd Up, it took eight or nine years for us to get that momentum. So yeah. if you're, anyone who's willing to, to fill a gap that's in our market, the, in, there's plenty of gaps in the Australian market. Anyone who's yeah. willing to to try and fill it. There's gaps there to be fit, to be filled, but you need to know that whoever does try to do it in 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 whatever sector is that it takes so much longer. Yeah, yeah. I um quickly touched on your indigenous, and we touched yeah. we've touched on rugby league. I mm. thought the Curry knockout is that how you say? It? Yeah, Curry? yeah, Curry. Yeah, Curry knockout was one of the coolest things I've watched in a long time. Man. We watched it at the pub at the Lapo. How We're hectic is it? it? Yeah, that was it's wild, bro. Yeah. And it's Georgie just like, Rose is getting yeah, ragged. Off. Yeah, yeah. And there's like there's. Like Latrell was playing against just like some some guys who, who, who probably just playing you know yeah. like C grade or or whatever, yeah, bro. Yeah. It's mad. It's and bro, like how 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 the Couriers run those types of events, bro. It's again the energy and stuff that's around us. It. Like yeah. it's this big community thing, bro. And bro, they live and breathe it. Like was, yeah. I had a meeting with a few of the few of the clubs that were looking um, to use us for um, some of their their merch and jerseys and that, bro. And like, Did I see? Bro, bro, they live and they live and breathe it. A red team maybe have cheated up on it. Nah, them? nah, we were we would we were going to, but we just couldn't get it done in time. Maybe yeah. for, but they they could have like I don't know used like an old sh- I don't I don't know, but yeah. nah, we didn't put any um not this year no. Yeah, that'd be sick. I think that's that was one of the coolest things it's I watched. Sick, hey, time. yeah. Oh, I want to see more of it. Yeah, they do. I'm pretty sure they do like a um a, a Murray knockout and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, bro, it's, that shit's yeah. mad. Newcastle, the Cessnock are the Dons, eh? In the career, yeah, I think the I think winners? the new, new Newcastle All Blacks won it this year. Yeah. Um, so so who, what? How it is? is whoever wins it, host they it. then host it the next year. So Nara won it last. Nara time, won it last year. And it was down in Nara um, this year, and Newcastle All Blacks. I'm pretty sure won. Did you ever play trade and this footy? Year. Hey, did you ever play footy? Nah, I played union at school. Yeah. Um, at PAC, but I played football my whole life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would love, bro. I love league. I, I played touch in that, um, but no, nah, I never, I never played it. I, I actually, to be honest, I wish I had of, bro. But, bro, I'm too fragile. I'm too fucking fat and fragile to yeah. try that shit yeah. now, bro. Yeah. <laughs> no way. I am. Um, I was actually never allowed to play league. Really? Mum wouldn't let me. Actually, funny, funny you say that. Actually, we um. We, because I grew up with two mums, so my mum got together with my, with my stepmom. So my mum's a lesbian. So yeah. my my stepmom Sue had three sons, and they all played rugby league. And me and my siblings, my brother and my si- I've got an older si- we've got an older sister as well. Yeah. We all played soccer, um, and then it just kind of stuck like that. I feel like if we wanted to play, actually, my brother played league uh, for a few years. But when we were younger, yeah, we weren't we weren't allowed either. I think my brother played for maybe three or four years when he was a teenager. But yeah. when we were kids, yeah, we weren't allowed either. But all of Sue's boys, they all played. So yeah. Um, I kind of wish I, I kind of wish I did because it's. I love watching it so yeah, much. You know, I love it now. I feel like I've begun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you reckon you'd be, center? I don't know. Eight? Nah, probably when I played when I played Union, I played halfback. So either yeah. either hooker or yeah, probably hooker. I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, I wasn't allowed to play league, but uh, my school teacher, my high school teacher, mm. used to beg me to go play league or Union. Yeah. I was never allowed, but when I was playing football, so Springwood got a rep side, like a prem side. Yeah. And I was in the Div 1 team as a goalkeeper and I was the only goalkeeper that trialed. And then um, it came to the last trial and they brought in a kid from Glenmore Park. And so basically the higher-ups had said to the coach at the time, like, we don't want him in goals, whatever. I thought it was a fucking cracker goalie, to be honest. Like, yeah. I, like I thought, I was, I was like... I Is that a position you always played? Yeah, but I think I was pretty big at the time. So I think it was like, and the, the kid they brought in, he's a gun goalkeeper. He's still goalkeeping in Prems. So, like, basically, only goalkeeper that trialed. The kid didn't even want to play for Springwood. They brought him in. So, I was like, fuck, I'm not going to go play Div 1. Mm-hmm. I don't want, if I'm not playing Prems, I'm going to play. So, I went and played AFL. Hectic. 
fucking way worse than Lee. Way rougher. Way rougher. Yeah. And I, like it took me, actually took me, first game I played, I made a kid cry and I felt bad. I said sorry to him. <laughs> like I just, I couldn't like fathom that type of physicality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it took me to uh, like basically get knocked out almost to be like, fuck, you got to use your weight here. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. You can't, like, Bro, it's rough. You see them. But you know what? It's funny because out in Western Sydney, it's like it's, or even in Sydney in general, bro, it's not that big, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of like- it's private school stuff. Yeah. 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 Same with you. Uh, no, actually, Union is all right in terms of club level, but AFL's always been like um, hills. Yeah, okay, and all right. that stuff. Really? So when we we're in the mountains, it was hard. Like it was yeah. hard, and you used to get battered. Like those yeah. private school boys got something about them. They yeah, are, yeah, <laughs> hard. They, they went around, and then yeah, I finally came back to football, and then I stopped playing. Is he still playing soccer now? Yeah. So two years ago, actually, we we'll play. We we'll trained up at Summer Hayes. Went for a front post header. I'd hit the guy behind me in the face and popped up. I got like perfect. Like I'm doing a bicycle here. Yeah. And I've put all my weight in my right leg, and I've heard like an. No, and I've thought like Talos, one of our mates, is a bit like funny bastard. I thought he's kicked the back of my leg, and it's dislocated, and I fell and it went back in. Later on, I realised it hadn't really properly healed, so my knee's still gone. And I turned around, I was on the ground, I screamed at Talos like, "Why would you kick me?" Something like that. And then Talos like, "Mate, like no one's anywhere near you. Like that's we've all just like, were you there? Yeah, yeah. Like just heard it pop it, and then um." Yeah, I'm going back next year. But I've been coaching. Oh, man, yeah. man. I'm a- we, I actually went back for the first time um, three and a bit years ago. And we just play in, like, in the, just like the Division, do, uh, the Division Two all-age comp around here in the Canberra. And we've gone back to back, back to back, back to back. Oh, beautiful. But, oh, sorry, that's a lie. Back to back minor premiers. Yeah. And then this year we lost the grand final to a team that I played with all these Irish lads like years ago. Yeah. Um, we've pretty much been undefeated. Um, play with a good bunch of lads and I've loved it. Yeah. Um, I play centre mid, bro, but it's like... COVID man I put on like 10, 12 kilos And fuck I'll be on there For 15, 20 minutes I'm blowing a gale bro I'm just like <gasps> And I can play I can navigate the team And I actually won an award This year Called called the Houdini bro Because I um my, The the coach said he's, he's, he's like you're, you're, you're one of the most talented and, and, and gifted players On the team But you just um You always just go missing bro <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll be like 10, 15 minute burst And I was like I've got to come off Or I've yeah. got like a wedding on Or some shit And this year I decided to go to Thailand For like five weeks And missed and shit and, Yeah um, But now I've, I've just lost like Eight kilos And I've got, got a little bit further to go So I'm keen for next year Just to Bro because if, you, if you're not fit If you can't move And get around the pitch bro Particularly when you're playing Centre mid yeah. You can't you just can't even get into the game, bro. Yeah. Fifteen the max I can go is for like fifteen, twenty minutes and I'm yeah proper blowing a go, you yeah. know. <laughs> See, I, I play centre mid, but my I play like six, not an eight. Yeah, okay. So I just clean up all the shit. Yeah, yeah. And then uh settle the game down. Because in Sunday league, everyone just wants to fucking get it up the yeah, pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was where I'd come in, but I was the same, fifteen, twenty minutes, get yeah. me off, get me back on, <laughs> yeah. get me off, get a yellow card, come back off. Yeah. And then, yeah. So um, so when's how long you been out for? When's the last season I played? 29? 29? No, no, I coached 2020. Yeah, yeah I played. No, I dislocated my knee going Man. into 2021. So you're going to go back next year? Yeah, I got treatment for it for a few months. It's still like this, still hurts. Yeah. And I had an issue. And this part of my legs like got tissue damage down there. But yeah. I figured, oh, fuck, I'll deal with it later. Get back into I'm, it, I'm bro. 22. I've got to go yeah. play my football. Yeah, I'm 31, bro. And I was like, oh, I reckon I've max got three or four more years in me. Yeah, yeah. Wait, so... Are you in the comp locally here? Canterbury comp, yeah. So it's like Mary. It, they call it Canterbury, but it's like it goes over to Balmain, um, Ashfield, all inner west, yeah, type thing. That's and shit. even out to like Roselands and shit. Yeah. I suppose that's why they call it Canterbury. But it it, it, it crosses over um, over to yeah Balmain. Yeah. All those first game well. of next year. I'm going mic'd up. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll send you the footage. And then yeah, if you want to go that. mic'd up, be my guest. Love that. Yeah, that's I, mad. Have you sponsored your team? You should. No, I've, I've, we've been every year. I've been trying to get them to to let us um, design and manufacture it because we can we can do it way better than than the. What um, colours are you? It's like this, like kind of similar to like Blue Mountains. Um, uh, it's Blue Mountains football club, like the sky the blue, blue and white. Yeah, yeah similar nice. to that. Um, yeah. I liked like you see like like Nike and Adidas and and that are doing it well is like using like patterns that are kind of like just got slight tonal differences with it and it like, yeah, just sits yeah, behind yeah. it. You know, it's. Some some of that shit I think is looking the best. Do you reckon Nigeria kit started that? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, look, bro. That's you, a bit more bold. Yeah, but yeah. But, yeah, but if you go back to like the like the eighties and nineties and shit, like like the that Arsenal pattern with the like the, the upside down triangles the and shit. Yeah, the and, bruised banana. Yeah, kit. Yeah, yeah. Um, bro, it's 
there's, there's so much mad shit you can do with it, yeah. eh? Yeah, fuck yeah. I want to sponsor my team, but yeah. I don't know if they'll let us, but we'll try and get something happening because I want to get all the boys mic'd up because of that thing I told you. I yeah, want to yeah. do like some of that content and I want to get every single player in the team mic'd up for at least one game. That's mad. And just see, I, like I'd love to hear because I talk the most. Yeah. But I, and sometimes like, I'm happy to criticize because I feel like I can do what they are yeah. not doing. Yeah. But I'd love to hear what like they say when like I turn my back and I go yeah, up the pitch. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's a good idea actually. Yeah. Um, and if you yeah, if you if you keen to talk about that other idea, um, that brand idea, or whatever, bro, yeah. just let me know and get on a call. I've on my Instagram. Bit of a soft launch, but yeah, I've, um, yeah, it's all getting started. I'll most probably do a podcast before the end of the year because I want to launch it in twenty twenty three. Man, uh, I just got to get like a few things down pat. I've got the badge and everything done. See, so the logo. You is, do it yourself. Uh, I like I got so I had two reference points for it. One's a Brazilian team and one's yeah. a swiss team man you'd know both clubs yeah and um i went to a, like one of the younger boys he's a designer like yeah. he works in design i said just pitching the whole idea of an hour of zoom and then he was like yeah done he just kind of did it and then he gave me like four or five or six and he was man. like which one i straight away knew so Sick, yeah bro it's exciting yeah I've even got any this. help you need bro yeah let me know yeah so yeah i'll soft launch that I'm, as we're speaking it's a bit of a soft launch but Man. Um, I'm keen to get into it. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. But quickly, before we head off, I ask everyone this question. Uh, advice. I've asked a few people about their advice in business, but I'd like to ask you for two. So I'm going to ask you for advice to 18 to 21-year-old males mm-hmm. and then advice to people, no matter what age they're in, just wanting to start their own business. So mm-hmm. we'll start off with the 18 to 21-year-old males. I think... Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, you know, touch back on a little bit what I was saying before. Just in terms of, yeah, try your hardest to learn to be honest with yourself. Don't don't, don't allow yourself to become too influenced by what's going on around you because like, at the end of the day, it's like everything, everything that, everything good that comes, that everything that's, everything good that's ahead of you will come from you being truthful and honest with yourself so be patient with that it's like you don't need to achieve like it again well like i was saying before social media and everything it's like we we've kind of we 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 search for things and we want things with you know instant gratification it's like slow things down and 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 just be patient and, and and connect with the people around you it's like the the more that you connect the more that will come whether it be your family your friends whatever double down double down on 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 your relationships um an eighteen to twenty one year old might not might not understand that relationship thing that I was talking about the relationship yeah. with yourself thing, but yeah. I think start start with in, ensuring that you're that you're truthful and honest with, with with yourself and your friends, and and bro and, and be patient and know that like shit doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, fuck yeah. Now to the business one because I know a lot of people. I'm going to post a clip of this and a lot of people will pay attention. Mm-hmm. What's your biggest advice, to people starting? Let's just say a small business. Uh, that's not requiring capital. Like yeah, man. Honestly, just start. It's like it's one, one of those things. Is like you, you can so easily get caught up in projecting where you think you want to get to. And I'm not saying don't have goals and don't have plans and stuff for sure. But the best way um, to, to to develop and learn and grow is just to fucking start. Have the balls first and foremost. Yeah, and get out of your comfort zone. It's like you. That the more if you're finding yourself talking about starting a business, bro, shut up and do it. That's it. Yeah. That's the only thing. It's like because when you do that, and t- and do it in a way, it's like th- there's going to be that kind of you know that that pivotal moment where you can get out of your whatever it is that's holding you back from doing it, whether it's your job. And more often than not, bro, it, that that's a security blanket. You're attached emotionally to the security that that job is yeah. providing you. If you really want to do it, and if your idea is that good. You, someone will give you the money. The bank will give you your money. Whatever you know. If I had a conversation with someone the other day, and he's like, "Oh, it's about the money." I said, "Bro, it's not about the money. If you, if you, if, if what you've got and you believe in yourself enough, and that's what it takes to make it, then the money you'll find the money. The, yeah. fun, the money's not the hard part. That's yeah. the security's not the hard part. It's it's your emotional attachment to the security. So you can you can build it, but you need to start. And yeah. it's like, bro, risk it all. Be, do not be scared of risking because it's like you will not win. While ever you're attached to that kind of security blanket that is your that is your comfort zone at the moment. Yeah. 
whatever you're attached to that, bro, you are never going to win. You're never going to get on top. Your business isn't going to start. But also, you know, ha- have the right intention and be honest. We, if your intention is to make money, then do it to make money and make yeah, make yeah. make your decisions about making money. Yeah. If it's about if it's a, if it's a passion thing, if it's a brand, then be honest with yourself about why you want to start it because yeah. you can really get caught up. And I think again with social media, you see everybody else winning and shit, but they don't post their losses. So you can attach yourself to this outcome that you think is super attainable, but actually takes heaps of climbing over massive obstacles and shit to get there yeah. so if it's attached if 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 why you want to start this thing is because you're attached to an outcome or or a particular status that might come from that outcome or or having you think that it's cool then be real with it with yourself about that and don't fucking start it do it do only start something if you believe in it if you believe that it's what that is right for you because how that translates and connects to to other people is 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 uh is based off of uh how honest it is to yourself. So if you're a brand or if you're trying to start something and it's clear that you're only in it to make money or it's clear that you're, you know, appropriating designs or the direction of another brand, you know, that that, that shit's transparent and people can see that. So it's like, make sure that you understand why you want to do it. And if if you're not certain about that yet, bro, spend a little bit more time. And then when, when, the, when the time is, when you feel like the time is right to risk it, then fucking go yeah. and do it. But but if, you, if you're feeling like you just want to, if you feel like that that time is now, then just do it. Don't don't yeah. worry about, bro. Like at the end of the day, if you if you've got it, if you've got a good family and good friends, if you lose all your money, bro, you'll find a way around it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stable jobs aren't going anywhere. Yeah, hundred percent, bro. Yeah. So, I, I I said a lot there, but I think I think fundamentally is is just start. Yeah. And then, bro. In reality, what it takes to win is like the people who who, who end up on top are the ones who are able to eat shit for the longest and persevere through the, yeah. through the hardship, bro. And, and know that you're not going to win overnight. Whatever the business is that you want to start, um, obviously do your due diligence and know what it is and why you want to start it. But, bro, yeah. like, like, I was, like I was saying to the young lad just here, he was talking about starting you know, his videography business. And he was like, I, he was like, I'm not sure exactly where I want to take it. It's like sometimes you don't know exactly where where you want to take it starting it is what is yeah. is, is, is is how you'll learn but yeah. at, at least just be honest with yourself is like if you want to if you want to make vi- videos to have impact then do it to have impact if you want to make videos to be well known or you want the yeah. attention then do that that's mad that's that's not bad yeah or if you want to do it to make heaps of money then mad do that too but your what your intention is will will define how you what what the decisions are that you make along the way yeah yeah, don't look for the end of the path. Just take your next step. Yeah, yeah, just take your next step. Beautiful. It was a pretty said. convoluted response, but there's a lot, bro. It's like it's, and this is the thing about advice. Don't, don't, don't take advice as gospel. You know, yeah. fuck. It's funny that I landed on that because, to be honest, bro, it's like you can hear so many people give their their thoughts and their opinions, and I think it's important to share. But at the end of the day, it's like it's it's really got to come from you. So yeah, that's that is the advice that I would give is don't take advice as gospel, bro. you yeah. the best advice is your own advice. Yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah, for a lot of a lot of people have asked about different answers, and they normally come back to that. Mm. It's normally about like your instinct, intuition, mm. kind of trusting yourself. But mm. also, the main theme is like, don't be too scared to take a risk. Yeah, like, what are we on this work? Like, That's it. We're not all here to work nine to five. So yeah, the whole time. Like, don't be too afraid to fucking do what makes you happy. If you yeah. got something you want to do, do it. Hundred. So where can the people find you? Bojied up on Instagram. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it, bro. Yeah. I, it's funny you actually you, you introduced me as as Bo Saywell. I actually changed my last name to my mum's maiden name like six months ago. So it's Bo Catley. Oh, Bo Catley. Bo, you wouldn't have known. No one yeah. knows that. But right. just um, yeah, Good I um, yeah. My, my brother changed his name to my mum's maiden name. Like I said, our, our dad kind of left when we were when we were younger. So it's um yeah. obviously ever, I'm kind of you know, I've, I've kind of just kept the the G'd up kind of as as the last name type thing. Yeah. It's funny actually. My uh, my mother in law. Um, and my, sorry, my grandmother-in-law for a while thought that my, that my last name was G'd up. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, bro. Because like, you know, you, you yeah. get introduced with your first name, and how would you how would you not know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, just just Bo G'd up on on Instagram. Yeah, fuck yeah. Uh, as always, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Thanks for coming on, brother. Honestly, my oh, man, thank you so much. It's I been really a long time coming, it. but I'm, yeah. I'm glad. I'm sorry to make you travel all the way, bro. But life's, nah, life's chaotic. I, no, this, <laughs> is, this is amazing. Oh, I and honestly, boys, better. whenever if you if you ever want to come in and work out of here, if you have got days off or whatever, man, there's there's desk space. That's what yeah. this, we want this space to be a bit of a hub. So, um, yeah. yeah, awesome. And to any listeners, if any of you want to, yeah, if you're ever looking for a, a place to connect with, um, 
with other creatives or people in business and stuff we've got this spot here in marrickville so just reach out yeah, through your Instagram or yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah, either or G'd up supply or or, yeah. or Bo G'd up. Yeah, because there's a few people listening that will like I know yeah. down here that will hundred. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Fuck yeah, my All man. Right, that's it for this week. Next week, Howie. So we'll see you there. Cheers, brother. My man. <laughs> <laughs>